Chapter 32 How the Company Took Counsel Round the Fallen Tree Where is Sir Claude Latou? asked Sir Nigel, as his feet touched ground. He is in camp, near Montpezat, two hours' march from here, my fair lord, said Johnston, the grizzled bowman who commanded the archers. Then we shall march thither, for I would fain have you all back at Dax in time to be in the prince's vanguard. My lord, cried Aline, joyfully, here are our charges in the field, and I see your harness amid the plunder which these rogues have left behind them. By St. Ives. You speak sooth, young squire, said Du Gesclin. There is my horse and my lady's jennet. The knaves led them from the stables, but fled without them. Now, Nigel, it is great joy to me to have seen one of whom I have often heard. Yet we must leave you now, for I must be with the King of Spain ere your army crosses the mountains. I had thought that you were in Spain with the valiant Henry of Trastamare. I have been there, but I came to France to raise succour for him. I shall ride back, Nigel, with four thousand of the best lances of France at my back, so that your prince may find he hath a task which is worthy of him. God be with you, friend, and may we meet again in better times. I do not think, said Sir Nigel, as he stood by Aline's side looking after the French knight and his lady, that in all Christom you will meet with a more stout-hearted man or a fairer and sweeter dame. But your face is pale and sad, Aline. Have you perchance met with some hurt during the ruffle? Nay, my fair lord, I was but thinking of my friend Ford, and how he sat upon my couch no later than yesternight. Sir Nigel shook his head sadly. Two brave squires have I lost, said he. I know not why the young shoots should be plucked, and an old weed left standing, yet certes there must be some good reason, since God hath so planned it. Did you not note, Aline, that the Lady Typhane did give us warning last night that danger was coming upon us? She did, my lord. By St. Paul. My mind misgives me as to what she saw at Twinham Castle. And yet I cannot think that any Scottish or French rovers could land in such force as to beleaguer the fortalice. Call the company together, Elwood, and let us on, for it will be shame to us if we are not at Dax upon the trysting day. The archers had spread themselves over the ruins, but a blast upon a bugle brought them all back to muster, with such booty as they could bear with them stuffed into their pouches or slung over their shoulders. As they formed into ranks, each man dropping silently into his place, Sir Nigel ran a questioning eye over them, and a smile of pleasure played over his face. Tall and sinewy, and brown, clear-eyed, hard-featured, with the stern and prompt bearing of experienced soldiers, it would be hard indeed for a leader to seek for a choice of following. Here and there in the ranks were old soldiers of the French wars, grizzled and lean, with fierce, puckered features and shaggy, bristling brows. The most, however, were young and dandy archers, with fresh English faces, their beards combed out, their hair curling from under their close steel hufkins, with gold or jeweled earrings gleaming in their ears, while their gold-spangled baldricks, their silken belts, and the chains which many of them wore round their thick brown necks, all spoke of the brave times which they had had as free companions. Each had a yew or hazel stave slung over his shoulder, plain and serviceable with the older men, but gaudily painted and carved at either end with the others. Steel caps, male brigandines, white surcoats with the red lion of St. George, and sword or battle axe swinging from their belts, completed this equipment, while in some cases the murderous maul or five-foot mallet was hung across the bowstave, being fastened to their leathern shoulder belt by a hook in the center of the handle. Sir Nigel's heart beat high as he looked upon their free-bearing and fearless faces. For two hours they marched through forest and marshland, along the left bank of the river Averon, Sir Nigel riding behind his company, with Aline at his right hand, and Johnston, the old master bowman, walking by his left stirrup. Ere they had reached their journeys and the knight had learned all that he would know of his men, their doings, and their intentions. Once, as they marched, they saw upon the further bank of the river a body of French men-at-arms, riding very swiftly in the direction of Villefranche. 
It is the Seneschal of Toulouse, with his following, said Johnston, shading his eyes with his hand. Had he been on this side of the water he might have attempted something upon us. I think that it would be well that we should cross, said Sir Nigel. It were pity to balk this worthy Seneschal, should he desire to try some small feat of arms. Nay, there is no ford nearer than Tuville, answered the old archer. He is on his way to Villafranche, and short will be the shrift of any jacks who come into his hands, for he is a man of short speech. It was he and the seneschal of Bucare who hung Peter Wilkins, of the company, last Lammastide, for which, by the black rood of Waltham, they shall hang themselves, if ever they come into our power. But here are our comrades, Sir Nigel, and here is our camp. As he spoke, the forest pathway along which they marched opened out into a green glade, which sloped down towards the river. High, leafless trees girt it in on three sides, with a thick undergrowth of holly between their trunks. At the farther end of this forest clearing there stood forty or fifty huts, built very neatly from wood and clay, with the blue smoke curling out from the roofs. A dozen tethered horses and mules grazed around the encampment, while a number of archers lounged about, some shooting at marks, while others built up great wooden fires in the open, and hung their cooking kettles above them. At the sight of their returning comrades there was a shout of welcome, and a horseman, who had been exercising his charger behind the camp, came cantering down to them. He was a dapper, brisk man, very richly clad, with a round, clean-shaven face, and very bright black eyes, which danced and sparkled with excitement. Sir Nigel, he cried. Sir Nigel Loring, at last. By my soul we have awaited you this month past. Right welcome, Sir Nigel. You have had my letter. It was that which brought me here, said Sir Nigel. But indeed, Sir Claude Latou, it is a great wonder to me that you did not yourself lead these bowmen, for surely they could have found no better leader. None, none, by the Virgin of El Espar, he cried, speaking in the strange, thick Gascon speech which turns every V into AB, but you know what these islanders of yours are, Sir Nigel. They will not be led by any save their own blood and race. There is no persuading them. Not even I, Claude Latou Seigneur of Montchateau, master of the high justice, the middle and the low, could gain their favour. They must needs hold a council and put their two hundred thick heads together, and then there comes this fellow Elwood and another, as their spokesman, to say that they will disband unless an Englishman of good name be set over them. There are many of them, as I understand, who come from some great forest which lies in Hampi, or Hampty I cannot lay my tongue to the name. Your dwelling is in those parts, and so their thoughts turn to you as their leader. But we had hoped that you would bring a hundred men with you. They are already at Dax, where we shall join them, said Sir Nigel. But let the men break their fast, and we shall then take counsel what to do. Come into my hut, said Sir Claude. It is but poor fare that I can lay before you milk, cheese, wine, and bacon, yet your squire and yourself will doubtless excuse it. This is my house where the pennon flies before the door a small residence to contain the Lord of Monchateau. Sir Nigel sat silent and distray at his meal, while Aline hearkened to the clattering tongue of the Gascon, and to his talk of the glories of his own estate, his successes in love, and his triumphs in war. And now that you are here, Sir Nigel, he said at last, I have many fine ventures all ready for us. I have heard that Montpezat is of no great strength, and that there are two hundred thousand crowns in the castle. At Castelnau also there is a cobbler who is in my pay and who will throw us a rope any dark night from his house by the town wall. I promise you that you shall thrust your arms elbow deep among good silver pieces ere the nights are moonless again, for on every hand of us are fair women, rich wine, and good plunder, as much as heart could wish. I have other plans, answered Sir Nigel curtly, for I have come hither to lead these bowmen to the help of the prince, our master, who may have saw need of them ere he set Pedro upon the throne of Spain. It is my purpose to start this very day for Dax upon the Adore, where he hath now pitched his camp. The face of the Gascon darkened, and his eyes flashed with resentment. For me, he said, I care little for this war, 
and I find the life which I lead a very joyous and pleasant one. I will not go to ducks. Nay, think again, Sir Claude, said Sir Nigel gently, for you have ever had the name of a true and loyal knight. Surely you will not hold back now when your master hath need of you. I will not go to Dax, the other shouted. But your devoir, your oath of fealty. I say that I will not go. Then, Sir Claude, I must lead the company without you. If they will follow, cried the Gascon with a sneer. These are not hired slaves, but free companions, who will do nothing save by their own good wills. In very sooth, my lord Loring, they are ill men to trifle with, and it were easier to pluck a bone from a hungry bear than to lead a bowman out of a land of plenty and of pleasure. Then I pray you to gather them together, said Sir Nigel, and I will tell them what is in my mind, for if I am their leader they must adax, and if I am not then I know not what I am doing in Oven. Have my horse ready, Aline, for, by St. Paul. Come what may, I must be upon the homeward road ere midday. A blast upon the bugle summoned the bowmen to council, and they gathered in little knots and groups around a great fallen tree which lay athwart the glade. Sir Nigel sprang lightly upon the trunk, and stood with blinking eye and firm lips looking down at the ring of upturned warlike faces. They tell me, bowmen, said he, that ye have grown so fond of ease and plunder and high living that ye are not to be moved from this pleasant country. But, by St. Paul, I will believe no such thing of you, for I can readily see that you are all very valiant men, who would scorn to live here in peace when your prince hath so great a venture before him. Ye have chosen me as a leader, and a leader I will be if ye come with me to Spain, and I vow to you that my pennon of the five roses shall, if God give me strength and life, be ever where there is most honour to be gained. But if it be your wish to loll and loiter in these glades, bartering glory and renown for vile gold and ill-gotten riches, then ye must find another leader, for I have lived in honour, and in honour I trust that I shall die. If there be forest men or Hampshire men amongst ye, I call upon them to say whether they will follow the banner of Loring. Here's a Romsey man for you, cried a young bowman with a sprig of evergreen set in his helmet. And a lad from Oresford, shouted another. And from Milton. And from Burley. And from Lymington. And a little one from Brockenhurst, shouted a huge limbed fellow who sprawled beneath a tree. By my hilt. Lads, cried Elwood, jumping upon the fallen trunk, I think that we could not look the girls in the eyes if we let the prince cross the mountains and did not pull string to clear a path for him. It is very well in time of peace to lead such a life as we have had together, but now the war banner is in the wind once more, and, by these ten finger bones. If ye go alone, old Samkin Elwood will walk beside it. These words from a man as popular as Elwood decided many of the waverers, and a shout of approval burst from his audience. Far be it from me, said Sir Claude Latou suavely, to persuade you against this worthy archer, or against Sir Nigel Loring, yet we have been together in many ventures, and perchance it may not be amiss if I say to you what I think upon the matter. Peace for the little Gascon, cried the archers. Let every man have his word. Shoot straight for the mark, lad, and fair play for all. Bethink you, then, said Sir Claude, that you go under a hard rule, with neither freedom nor pleasure, and for what? For sixpence a day, at the most, while now you may walk across the country and stretch out either hand to gather in whatever you have a mind for. What do we not hear of our comrades who have gone with Sir John Hawkwood to Italy? In one night they have held to ransom six hundred of the richest noblemen of Mantua. They camp before a great city, and the base burghers come forth with the keys, and then they make great spoil, or, if it please them better, they take so many horse loads of silver as a composition, and so they journey on from state to state, rich and free and feared by all. Now, is not that the proper life for a soldier? The proper life for a robber, roared Hordle John in his thundering voice. And yet there is much in what the Gascon says, said a swarthy fellow in a weather-stained doublet, and I for one would rather prosper in Italy than starve in Spain. You are always a cur and a traitor, 
Mark Shaw, cried Elwood. By my hilt. If you will stand forth and draw your sword I will warrant you that you will see neither one nor the other. Nay, Elwood, said Sir Nigel, we cannot mend the matter by broiling. Sir Claude, I think that what you have said does you little honour, and if my words aggrieve you I am ever ready to go deeper into the matter with you. But you shall have such men as will follow you, and you may go where you will, so that you come not with us. Let all who love their prince and country stand fast, while those who think more of a well-lined purse step forth upon the farther side. Thirteen bowmen, with hung heads and sheepish faces, stepped forward with Mark Shaw and ranged themselves behind Sir Claude. Amid the hootings and hissings of their comrades, they marched off together to the Gascon's hut, while the main body broke up their meeting and set cheerily to work packing their possessions, furbishing their weapons, and preparing for the march which lay before them. Over the Tarn and the Garonne, through the vast quagmires of Armagnac, past the swift-flowing Loss, and so down the long valley of the Adour, there was many a long league to be crossed ere they could join themselves to that dark war cloud which was drifting slowly southwards to the line of the snowy peaks, beyond which the banner of England had never yet been seen. Chapter 33 How the Army Made the Passage of Roncesvalles the whole vast plain of Gascony and of Languedoc is an arid and profitless expanse in winter save where the swift-flowing Adour and her snow-fed tributaries, the Louts, the Oleron, and the Pau, run down to the Sea of Biscay. South of the Adour the jagged line of mountains which fringe the skyline send out long granite claws, running down into the lowlands and dividing them into gaves or stretches of valley. Hillocks grow into hills, and hills into mountains, each range overlying its neighbour, until they saw up in the giant chain which raises its spotless and untrodden peaks, white and dazzling, against the pale blue wintry sky. A quiet land is this a land where the slow-moving Basque, with his flat beretta cap, his red sash and his hempen sandals, tills his scanty farm or drives his lean flock to their hillside pastures. It is the country of the wolf and the izzard, of the brown bear and the mountain goat, a land of bare rock and of rushing water. Yet here it was that the will of a great prince had now assembled a gallant army, so that from the Adore to the passes of Navarre the barren valleys and windswept wastes were populous with soldiers and loud with the shouting of orders and the neighing of horses. For the banners of war had been flung to the wind once more, and over those glistening peaks was the highway along which honour pointed in an age when men had chosen her as their guide. And now all was ready for the enterprise. From Dax to St. Jean Pied du Port the country was mottled with the white tents of Gascons, Aquitanians, and English, all eager for the advance. From all sides the free companions had trooped in, until not less than twelve thousand of these veteran troops were cantoned along the frontiers of Navarre. From England had arrived the prince's brother, the Duke of Lancaster, with four hundred knights in his train and a strong company of archers. Above all, an heir to the throne had been born in Bordeaux and the prince might leave his spouse with an easy mind, for all was well with mother and with child. The keys of the mountain passes still lay in the hands of the shifty and ignoble Charles of Navarre, who had chaffered and bargained both with the English and with the Spanish, taking money from the one side to hold them open and from the other to keep them sealed. The mallet hand of Edward, however, had shattered all the schemes and whirls of the plotter. Neither entreaty nor courtly remonstrance came from the English prince, but Sir Hugh Calverley passed silently over the border with his company, and the blazing walls of the two cities of Miranda and Puente de la Reina warned the unfaithful monarch that there were other metals besides gold, and that he was dealing with a man to whom it was unsafe to lie. His price was paid, his objections silenced, and the mountain gorges lay open to the invaders. From the feast of the Epiphany there was mustering and massing, until, in the first week of February, three days after the White Company joined the army, the word was given for a general advance through the defile of Roncesvalles. At five in the cold winter's morning the bugles were blowing in the hamlet of St. Jean Pied du Port, and by six Sir Nigel's company, three hundred strong, were on their way for the defile, pushing swiftly in the dim light up the steep curving road, for it was the prince's order that they should be the first to pass through and that they should remain on guard at the further end until the whole army had emerged from the mountains. Day was already breaking in the east, and the summits of the great peaks had turned rosy red, 
while the valley still lay in the shadow, when they found themselves with the cliffs on either hand and the long, rugged pass stretching away before them. Sir Nigel rode his great black war horse at the head of his archers, dressed in full armour, with Black Simon bearing his banner behind him, while Aline at his bridal arm carried his blazoned shield and his well-steeled ashen spear. A proud and happy man was the knight, and many a time he turned in his saddle to look at the long column of bowmen who swung swiftly along behind him. By St. Paul. Aline, said he, this pass is a very perilous place, and I would that the King of Navarre had held it against us, for it would have been a very honourable venture had it fallen to us to win a passage. I have heard the minstrels sing of one Sir Roland who was slain by the infidels in these very parts. If it please you, my fair lord, said Black Simon, I know something of these parts, for I have twice served a term with the King of Navarre. There is a hospice of monks yonder, where you may see the roof among the trees, and there it was that Sir Roland was slain. The village upon the left is Orbasita, and I know a house therein where the right wine of Durancarn is to be bought, if it would please you to quaff a morning cup. There is smoke yonder upon the right. That is a village named Les Aldudes, and I know a hostel there also where the wine is of the best. It is said that the innkeeper of the buried treasure, and I doubt not, my fair lord, that if you grant me leave I could prevail upon him to tell us where he hath hid it. Nay, nay, Simon, said Sir Nigel curtly, I pray you to forget these free companion tricks. Ha! Edrickson, I see that you stare about you, and in good sooth these mountains must seem wondrous indeed to one who hath but seen Butzer or the ports downhill. The broken and rugged road had wound along the crests of low hills, with wooded ridges on either side of it over which peeped the loftier mountains, the distant peak of the south and the vast Altabisca, which towered high above them and cast its black shadow from left to right across the valley. From where they now stood they could look forward down a long vista of beech woods and jagged rock-strewn wilderness, all white with snow, to where the pass opened out upon the uplands beyond. Behind them they could still catch a glimpse of the grey plains of Gascony, and could see her rivers gleaming like coils of silver in the sunshine. As far as I could see from among the rocky gorges and the bristles of the pine woods there came the quick twinkle and glitter of steel, while the wind brought with it sudden distant bursts of martial music from the great host which rolled by every road and by path towards the narrow pass of Roncesvalles. On the cliffs on either side might also be seen the flash of arms and the waving of pennons where the force of Navarre looked down upon the army of strangers who passed through their territories. By St. Paul, said Sir Nigel, blinking up at them, I think that we have much to hope for from these cavaliers, for they cluster very thickly upon our flanks. Pass word to the men, Elwood, that they unsling their bows, for I have no doubt that there are some very worthy gentlemen yonder who may give us some opportunity for honourable advancement. I hear that the Prince of the King of Navarre is hostage, said Aline, and it is said that he hath sworn to put him to death if there be any attack upon us. It was not so that war was made when good King Edward first turned his hand to it, said Sir Nigel sadly. Ah! Aline, I fear that you will never live to see such things, for the minds of men are more set upon money and gain than of old. By St. Paul. It was a noble sight when two great armies would draw together upon a certain day, and all who had a vow would ride forth to discharge themselves of it. What noble spear runnings have I not seen, and even in an humble way had a part in, when cavaliers would run a course for the easing of their souls and for the love of their ladies. Never a bad word have I for the French, for, though I have ridden twenty times up to their array, I have never yet failed to find some very gentle and worthy knight or squire who was willing to do what he might to enable me to attempt some small feat of arms. Then, when all cavaliers had been satisfied, the two armies would come to handstrokes, and fight right merrily until one or other had the vantage. By St. Paul. It was not our wont in those days to pay gold for the opening of passes, nor would we hold a king as hostage lest his people come to thrusts with us. In good sooth, if the war is to be carried out in such a fashion, then it is grief to me that I ever came away from Castle Twinham, for I would not have left my sweet lady had I not thought that there were deeds of arms to be done. But surely, my fair lord, said Aline, you have done some great feats of arms since we left the Lady Loring. 
I cannot call any to mind, answered Sir Nigel. There was the taking of the sea rovers, and the holding of the keep against the jacks. Nay, nay, said the knight, these were not feats of arms, but mere wayside ventures and the chances of travel. By St. Paul. If it were not that these hills are over steep for pomace, I would ride to these cavaliers of Navarre and see if there were not some among them who would help me to take this patch from mine eye. It is a sad sight to see this very fine pass, which my own company here could hold against an army, and yet to ride through it with as little profit as though it were the lane from my kennels to the Avon. All morning Sir Nigel rode in a very ill humour, with his company tramping behind him. It was a toilsome march over broken ground and through snow, which came often as high as the knee, yet ere the sun had begun to sink they had reached the spot where the gorge opens out onto the uplands of Navarre, and could see the towers of Pampeluna jutting up against the southern skyline. Here the company were quartered in a scattered mountain hamlet, and Aline spent the day looking down upon the swarming army which poured with gleam of spears and flaunt of standards through the narrow pass. Ola, Mongar, said Elwood, seating himself upon a boulder by his side. This is indeed a fine sight upon which it is good to look, and a man might go far ere he would see so many brave men and fine horses. By my hilt! Our little lord is wroth because we have come peacefully through the passes, but I will warrant him that we have fighting in our ere we turn our faces northward again. It is said that there are fourscore thousand men behind the King of Spain, with Du Guesclin and all the best lances of France, who have sworn to shed their heart's blood ere this Pedro come again to the throne. Yet our own army is a great one, said Aline. Nay, there are but seven and twenty thousand men. Chandos hath persuaded the prince to leave many behind, and indeed I think that he is right, for there is little food and less water in these parts for which we are bound. A man without his meat or a horse without his fodder is like a wet bowstring, fit for little. But Voila, mon petit, here comes Chandos and his company, and there is many a pencil and banderole among yonder squadrons which show that the best blood of England is riding under his banners. Whilst Elwood had been speaking, a strong column of archers had defiled through the pass beneath them. They were followed by a banner-bearer who held high the scarlet wedge upon a silver field which proclaimed the presence of the famous warrior. He rode himself within a spear's length of his standard, clad from neck to foot in steel, but draped in the long linen gown or pairment which was destined to be the cause of his death. His plumed helmet was carried behind him by his body squire, and his head was covered by a small purple cap, from under which his snow-white hair curled downwards to his shoulders. With his long beak-like nose and his single gleaming eye, which shone brightly from under a thick tuft of grizzled brow, he seemed to Aline to have something of the look of some fierce old bird of prey. For a moment he smiled, as his eye lit upon the banner of the five roses waving from the hamlet, but his course lay for Pampeluna, and he rode on after the archers. Close at his heels came sixteen squires, all chosen from the highest families, and behind them rode twelve hundred English knights, with gleam of steel and tossing of plumes, their harness jingling, their long straight swords clanking against their stirrup irons, and the beat of their chargers hoofs like the low deep roar of the sea upon the shore. Behind them marched six hundred Cheshire and Lancashire archers, bearing the badge of the Audleys, followed by the famous Lord Audley himself, with the four valiant squires, Dutton of Dutton, Delves of Doddington, Falhurst of Crewe, and Hawkstone of Wainhill, who had all won such glory at Poictiers. Two hundred heavily armed cavalry rode behind the Audley standard, while close at their heels came the Duke of Lancaster with a glittering train, heralds tabard with the royal arms riding three deep upon cream-coloured chargers in front of him. On either side of the young prince rode the two seneschals of Aquitaine, Sir Giscard d'Angle and Sir Stephen Cassington, the one bearing the banner of the province and the other that of St. George. Away behind him as far as I could reach rolled the far-stretching, unbroken river of steel rank after rank and column after column, with waving of plumes, glitter of arms, tossing of guidons, and flash and flutter of countless armorial devices. All day Aline looked down upon the changing scene, and all day the old bowman stood by his elbow, pointing out the crests of famous warriors and the arms of noble houses. Here were the gold mullets of the Pakingtons, the sable and ermine of the Mackworths, 
the scarlet bars of the wakes, the gold and blue of the groveners, the sankfoils of the cliftons, the amulets of the musgraves, the silver pinions of the beechams, the crosses of the molinos, the bloody chevron of the woodhouses, the red and silver of the worsleys, the swords of the clerks, the boar's heads of the looses, the crescents of the boyntons, and the wolf and dagger of the lipscombs. So through the sunny winter day the chivalry of England poured down through the dark pass of Roncesvalles to the plains of Spain. It was on a Monday that the Duke of Lancaster's division passed safely through the Pyrenees. On the Tuesday there was a bitter frost, and the ground rung like iron beneath the feet of the horses, yet ere evening the prince himself, with the main battle of his army, had passed the gorge and united with his vanguard at Pampeluna. With him rode the King of Majorca, the hostage King of Navarre, and the fierce Don Pedro of Spain, whose pale blue eyes gleamed with a sinister light as they rested once more upon the distant peaks of the land which had disowned him. Under the royal banners rode many a bold Gascon baron and many a hot-blooded islander. Here were the high stewards of Aquitaine, of Saint-Onge, of La Rochelle, of Quercy, of Limousin, of Agenois, of Poitou, and of Bigger, with the banners and musters of their provinces. Here also were the valiant Earl of Angus, Sir Thomas Banaster with his garter over his grieve, Sir Nelly Loring, second cousin to Sir Nigel, and a long column of Welsh footmen who marched under the red banner of Merlin. From dawn to sundown the long train wound through the pass, their breath reeking up upon the frosty air like the steam from a cauldron. The weather was less keen upon the Wednesday, and the rigard made good their passage, with the bombards and the wagon train. Free companions and Gascons made up this portion of the army to the number of ten thousand men. The fierce Sir Hugh Calverley, with his yellow manet, and the rugged Sir Robert Knowles, with their war-hardened and veteran companies of English bowmen, headed the long column, while behind them came the turbulent bands of the Bastard of Bretuel, Nandon de Bajorant, One-Eyed Camus, Black Ortingo, Lanuit, and others whose very names seemed to smack of hard hands and ruthless deeds. With them also were the pick of the Gascon chivalry, the old Duc d'Armagnac, his nephew Lord d'Albret, brooding and scowling over his wrongs, the giant Oliver de Clisson, the Captal de Bach, pink of knighthood, the sprightly Sir Paducas d'Albret, the red-bearded Lord d'Espar, and a long train of needy and grasping border nobles, with long pedigrees and short purses, who had come down from their hillside strongholds, all hungering for the spoils and the ransoms of Spain. By the Thursday morning the whole army was encamped in the Vale of Pampeluna, and the prince had called his council to meet him in the old palace of the ancient city of Navarre. Chapter 34 How the Company Made Sport in the Vale of Pampeluna Whilst the council was sitting in Pampeluna the White Company, having encamped in a neighbouring valley, close to the companies of La Nuit and of Black Ortingo, were amusing themselves with swordplay, wrestling, and shooting at the shields, which they had placed upon the hillside to serve them as butts. The younger archers, with their coats of mail thrown aside, their brown or flaxen hair tossing in the wind, and their jerkins turned back to give free play to their brawny chests and arms, stood in lines, each loosing his shaft in turn, while Johnston, Elwood, Black Simon, and half a score of the elders lounged up and down with critical eyes, and a word of rough praise or of curt censure for the marksman. Behind stood knots of Gascon and Brabant crossbowmen from the companies of Ortingo and of Lanuit, leaning upon their unsightly weapons and watching the practice of the Englishmen. A good shot, Hewitt, a good shot, said old Johnston to a young bowman, who stood with his bow in his left hand, gazing with parted lips after his flying shaft. You see, she finds the ring, as I knew she would from the moment that your string twanged. Loose it easy, steady, and yet sharp, said Elwood. By my hilt. Mongar, it is very well when you do but shoot at a shield, but when there is a man behind the shield, and he rides at you with wave of sword and glint of eyes from behind his visor, you may find him a less easy mark. It is a mark that I have found before now, answered the young bowman. And shall again, camarade, I doubt not. But Ola! Johnston, who is this who holds his bow like a crowkeeper? It is Silas Peterson, of Horsham. Do not wink with one eye and look with the other, Silas, and do not hop and dance after you shoot, with your tongue out, 
for that will not speed it upon its way. Stand straight and firm, as God made you. Move not the bow arm, and steady with the drawing hand. I faith, said Black Simon, I am a spearman myself, and am more fitted for handstrokes than for such work as this. Yet I have spent my days among bowmen, and I have seen many a brave shaft sped. I will not say but that we have some good marksmen here, and that this company would be accounted a fine body of archers at any time or place. Yet I do not see any men who bend so strong a bow or shoot as true a shaft as those whom I have known. You say sooth, said Johnston, turning his seamed and grizzled face upon the man-at-arms. See yonder, he added, pointing to a bombard which lay within the camp, there is what hath done scath to good bowmanship, with its filthy soot and foolish roaring mouth. I wonder that a true knight, like our prince, should carry such a scurvy thing in his train. Robin, thou red-headed Lurden, how oft must I tell thee not to shoot straight with a quarter wind blowing across the mark? By these ten finger bones. There were some fine bowmen at the intaking of Calais, said Elwood. I well remember that, on occasion of an outfall, a Genoan raised his arm over his mantlet, and shook it at us, a hundred paces from our line. There were twenty who loosed shafts at him, and when the man was afterwards slain it was found that he had taken eighteen through his forearm. And I can call to mind, remarked Johnston, that when the great cop Christopher, which the French had taken from us, was more two hundred paces from the shore, two archers, little Robin with staff and Elias Badlesmere, in four shots each cut every strand of her hempen anchor cord, so that she well nigh came upon the rocks. Good shooting, I faith rare shooting, said Black Simon. But I have seen you, Johnston, and you, Samkin Elwood, and one or two others who are still with us, shoot as well as the best. Was it not you, Johnston, who took the fat ox at Finsbury butts against the pick of London town? A sunburnt and black-eyed Brabanter had stood near the old archers, leaning upon a large crossbow and listening to their talk, which had been carried on in that hybrid camp dialect which both nations could understand. He was a squat, bull-necked man, clad in the iron helmet, male tunic, and woolen gambeson of his class. A jacket with hanging sleeves, slashed with velvet at the neck and wrists, showed that he was a man of some consideration, an under-officer, or far leader of his company. I cannot think, said he, why you English should be so fond of your six-foot stick. If it amuse you to bend it, well and good, but why should I strain and pull, when my little Milanay will do all for me, and better than I can do it for myself? I have seen good shooting with the prod and with the latch, said Elwood, but, by my hilt. Camerade, with all respect to you and to your bow, I think that is but a woman's weapon, which a woman can point and loose as easily as a man. I know not about that, answered the Brabanter, but this I know, that though I have served for fourteen years, I have never yet seen an Englishman do aught with the long bow which I could not do better with my arbalist. By the three kings. I would even go further, and say that I have done things with my arbalist which no Englishman could do with his long bow. Well said, Mongar, cried Elwood. A good cock has ever a brave call. Now, I have shot little of late, but there is Johnston here who will try a round with you for the honour of the company. And I will lay a gallon of Durancon wine upon the long bow, said Black Simon, though I had rather, for my own drinking, that it were a quart of twin ale. I take both your challenge and your wager, said the man of Brabant, throwing off his jacket and glancing keenly about him with his black, twinkling eyes. I cannot see any fitting mark, for I care not to waste a bolt upon these shields, which a drunken boar could not miss at a village kermess. This is a perilous man, whispered an English man-at-arms, plucking at Elwood's sleeve. He is the best marksman of all the crossbow companies and it was he who brought down the constable de Bourbon at Brigney. I fear that your man will come by little honour with him. Yet I have seen Johnston shoot these twenty years, and I will not flinch from it. How say you, old warhound, will you not have a flight shot or two with this springled? Tut, tut, Elwood, said the old bowman. My day is past, and it is for the younger ones to hold what we have gained. I take it unkindly of thee, Samkin, 
that thou shouldst call all eyes thus upon a broken bowman who could once shoot a fair shaft. Let me feel that bow, Wilkins. It is a scotch bow, I see, for the upper knock is without and the lower within. By the black rood. It is a good piece of you, well knocked, well strung, well waxed, and very joyful to the feel. I think even now that I might hit any large and goodly mark with a bow like this. Turn thy quiver to me, Elwood. I love an ash arrow pierced with corner wood for a roving shaft. By my hilt. And so do I, cried Elwood. These three gander winged shafts are such. So I see, comrade. It has been my wont to choose a saddle backed feather for a dead shaft, and a swine backed for a smooth flyer. I will take the two of them. Ah! Samkin, lad, the eye grows dim and the hand less firm as the years pass. Come then, are you not ready, said the Brabanter, who had watched with ill-concealed impatience the slow and methodic movements of his antagonist. I will venture a rover with you, or try longbutts or hoyles, said old Johnston. To my mind the longbow is a better weapon than the arbalist, but it may be ill for me to prove it. So I think, quoth the other with a sneer. He drew his milanay from his girdle, and fixing it to the windlass, he drew back the powerful double cord until it had clicked into the catch. Then from his quiver he drew a short, thick quarrel, which he placed with the utmost care upon the groove. Word had spread of what was going forward, and the rivals were already surrounded, not only by the English archers of the company, but by hundreds of arbalestiers and men-at-arms from the bands of Ortingo and Lanuit to the latter of which the Brabanter belonged. There is a mark yonder on the hill, said he, mayhap you can discern it. I see something, answered Johnston, shading his eyes with his hand, but it is a very long shoot. A fair shoot, a fair shoot. Stand aside, Arnor, lest you find a bolt through your gizzard. Now, comrade, I take no flight shot, and I give you the vantage of watching my shaft. As he spoke he raised his arbalist to his shoulder and was about to pull the trigger, when a large grey stalk flapped heavily into view skimming over the brow of the hill, and then soaring up into the air to pass the valley. Its shrill and piercing cries drew all eyes upon it, and, as it came nearer, a dark spot which circled above it resolved itself into a peregrine falcon, which hovered over its head, poising itself from time to time, and watching its chance of closing with its clumsy quarry. Nearer and nearer came the two birds, all absorbed in their own contest, the stork wheeling upwards, the hawk still fluttering above it, until they were not a hundred paces from the camp. The Brabanter raised his weapon to the sky, and there came the short, deep twang of his powerful string. His bolt struck the stork just where its wing meets the body, and the bird whirled aloft in a last convulsive flutter before falling wounded and flapping to the earth. A roar of applause burst from the crossbowmen, but at the instant that the bolt struck its mark old Johnston, who had stood listlessly with arrow on string, bent his bow and sped a shaft through the body of the falcon. Whipping the other from his belt, he sent it skimming some few feet from the earth with so true an aim that it struck and transfixed the stalk for the second time ere it could reach the ground. A deep-chested shout of delight burst from the archers at the sight of this double feat, and Elwood, dancing with joy, threw his arms round the old marksman and embraced him with such vigour that their male tunics clanged again. Ah! Camarade, he cried, you shall have a stoop with me for this. What then, old dog, would not the hawk please thee, but thou must have the stalk as well. Oh, to my heart again! It is a pretty piece of you, and well strung, said Johnston with a twinkle in his deep-set grey eyes. Even an old broken bowman might find the clout with a bow like this. You have done very well, remarked the Brabanter in a surly voice. But it seems to me that you have not yet shown yourself to be a better marksman than I, for I have struck that at which I aimed, and, by the three kings, no man can do more. It would ill beseem me to claim to be a better marksman, answered Johnston, for I have heard great things of your skill. I did but wish to show that the longbow could do that which an arbalist could not do, for you could not with your milanay have your string ready to speed another shaft ere the bird dropped to the earth. In that you have vantage, said the crossbowman. 
by Saint James. It is now my turn to show you where my weapon has the better of you. I pray you to draw a flight shaft with all your strength down the valley, that we may see the length of your shoot. That is a very strong prod of yours, said Johnston, shaking his grizzled head as he glanced at the thick arch and powerful strings of his rival's arbalist. I have little doubt that you can overshoot me, and yet I have seen bowmen who could send a clothyard arrow further than you could speed a quarrel. So I have heard, remarked the Brabanter, and yet it is a strange thing that these wondrous bowmen are never where I chance to be. Pace out the distances with a wand at every five score, and do you, Arnor, stand at the fifth one to carry back my bolts to me. A line was measured down the valley, and Johnston, drawing an arrow to the very head, sent it whistling over the row of wands. Bravely drawn. A rare shoot, shouted the bystanders. It is well up to the fourth mark. By my hilt. It is over it, cried Elwood. I can see where they have stooped to gather up the shaft. We shall hear anon, said Johnston quietly, and presently a young archer came running to say that the arrow had fallen twenty paces beyond the fourth wand. Four hundred paces and a score, cried Black Simon. I faith, it is a very long flight. Yet wood and steel may do more than flesh and blood. The Brabanter stepped forward with a smile of conscious triumph, and loosed the cord of his weapon. A shout burst from his comrades as they watched the swift and lofty flight of the heavy bolt. Over the fourth, groaned Elwood. By my hilt. I think that it is well up to the fifth. It is over the fifth, cried a Gascon loudly and a comrade came running with waving arms to say that the bolt had pitched eight paces beyond the mark of the five hundred. Which weapon of the vantage now, cried the Brabanter, strutting proudly about with shouldered arbalist, amid the applause of his companions. You can overshoot me, said Johnston gently. Or any other man who ever bent a longbow, cried his victorious adversary. Nay, not so fast, said a huge archer, whose mighty shoulders and red head towered high above the throng of his comrades. I must have a word with you ere you crow so loudly. Where is my little popper? By sainted dick of Hampole. It will be a strange thing if I cannot outshoot that thing of thine, which to my eyes is more like a rat trap than a bow. Will you try another flight, or do you stand by your last? Five hundred and eight paces will serve my turn, answered the Brabanter, looking askance at this new opponent. Tut, John, whispered Elwood, you never were a marksman. Why must you thrust your spoon into this dish? Easy and slow, Elwood. There are very many things which I cannot do, but there are also one or two which I have the trick of. It is in my mind that I can beat this shoot, if my bow will but hold together. Go on, old babe of the woods. Have at it, Hampshire, cried the archers laughing. By my soul. You may grin, cried John. But I learned how to make the long shoot from old Hob Miller of Milford. He took up a great black bow, as he spoke, and sitting down upon the ground he placed his two feet on either end of the stave. With an arrow fitted, he then pulled the string towards him with both hands until the head of the shaft was level with the wood. The great bow creaked and groaned and the cord vibrated with the tension. Who is this fool's head who stands in the way of my shoot, said he, craning up his neck from the ground. He stands on the further side of my mark, answered the Brabanter, so he has little to fear from you. Well, the saints assoil him, cried John, though I think he is over near to be scathed. As he spoke he raised his two feet, with the bow stave upon their soles and his cord twanged with a deep rich hum which might be heard across the valley. The measurer in the distance fell flat upon his face, and then jumping up again, he began to run in the opposite direction. Well shot, old lad. It is indeed over his head, cried the bowman. Mon die you, exclaimed the Brabanter, whoever saw such a shoot? It is but a trick, quoth John. Many a time have I won a gallon of ale by covering a mile in three flights down Wilverley Chase. 
It fell a hundred and thirty paces beyond the fifth mark, shouted an archer in the distance. Six hundred and thirty paces. Mun Dai Yu. But that is a shoot. And yet it says nothing for your weapon, Mon Gross Camarade, for it was by turning yourself into a crossbow that you did it. By my hilt. There is truth in that, cried Elwood. And now, friend, I will myself show you a vantage of the longbow. I pray you to speed a bolt against yonder shield with all your force. It is an inch of elm with bull's hide over it. I scarce shot as many shafts at Brigney, growled the man of Brabant, though I found a better mark there than a cantle of bull's hide. But what is this, Englishman? The shield hangs not one hundred paces from me, and a blind man could strike it. He screwed up his string to the furthest pitch, and shot his quarrel at the dangling shield. Elwood, who had drawn an arrow from his quiver, carefully greased the head of it, and sped it at the same mark. Run, Wilkins, quoth he, and fetch me the shield. Long were the faces of the Englishmen and broad the laugh of the crossbowmen as the heavy mantlet was carried towards them, for there in the centre was the thick Brabant bolt driven deeply into the wood, while there was neither sign nor trace of the clothyard shaft. By the three kings, cried the Brabanter, this time at least there is no gainsaying which is the better weapon, or which the true hand that held it. You have missed the shield, Englishman. Tarry a bit. Tarry a bit, Mongar, quoth Elwood, and turning round the shield he showed a round clear hole in the wood at the back of it. My shaft has passed through it, camarade, and I trow the one which goes through is more to be feared than that which bides on the way. The Brabanter stamped his foot with mortification, and was about to make some angry reply, when Aline Edrickson came riding up to the crowds of archers. Sir Nigel will be here anon, said he, and it is his wish to speak with the company. In an instant order and method took the place of general confusion. Bows, steel caps, and jacks were caught up from the grass. A long cordon cleared the camp of all strangers, while the main body fell into four lines with under-officers and file leaders in front and on either flank. So they stood, silent and motionless, when their leader came riding towards them, his face shining and his whole small figure swelling with the news which he bore. Great honour has been done to us, men, cried he, for, of all the army, the prince has chosen us out that we should ride onwards into the lands of Spain to spy upon our enemies. Yet, as there are many of us, and as the service may not be to the liking of all, I pray that those will step forward from the ranks who have the will to follow me. There was a rustle among the bowmen, but when Sir Nigel looked up at them no man stood forward from his fellows, but the four lines of men stretched unbroken as before. Sir Nigel blinked at them in amazement, and a look of the deepest sorrow shadowed his face. That I should live to see the day, he cried. What? Not one. My fair lord, whispered Aline, they have all stepped forward. Ah, by Saint Paul. I see how it is with them. I could not think that they would desert me. We start at dawn tomorrow, and ye are to have the horses of Sir Robert Cheney's company. Be ready, I pray ye, at early cockcrow. A buzz of delight burst from the archers, as they broke their ranks and ran hither and thither, whooping and cheering like boys who have news of a holiday. Sir Nigel gazed after them with a smiling face, when a heavy hand fell upon his shoulder. What ho! My knight-errant of Twinham, said a voice, you are off to Ebro, I hear, and, by the holy fish of Tobias. You must take me under your banner. What? Sir Oliver Buttisthorne, cried Sir Nigel. I had heard that you were come into camp, and had hoped to see you. Glad and proud shall I be to have you with me. I have a most particular and weighty reason for wishing to go, said the sturdy knight. I can well believe it, returned Sir Nigel, I have met no man who is quicker to follow where honour leads. Nay, it is not for honour that I go, Nigel. For what then? For pullets. Pullets. Yes, for the rascal vanguard have cleared every hen from the countryside. 
It was this very morning that Norbury, my squire, lamed his horse in riding round in quest of one, for we have a bag of truffles, and naught to eat with them. Never have I seen such locusts as this vanguard of ours. Not a pullet shall we see until we are in front of them, so I shall leave my Winchester runagates to the care of the provost marshal, and I shall hie south with you, Nigel, with my truffles at my saddlebow. Oliver, Oliver, I know you over well, said Sir Nigel, shaking his head, and the two old soldiers rode off together to their pavilion. Chapter 35 How Sir Nigel Hawked at an Eagle To the south of Pampeluna in the kingdom of Navarre there stretched a high table land, rising into bare, sterile hills, brown or grey in colour, and strewn with huge boulders of granite. On the Gascon side of the great mountains there had been running streams, meadows, forests, and little nestling villages. Here, on the contrary, were nothing but naked rocks, poor pasture, and savage, stone-strewn wastes. Gloomy defiles or barrancas intersected this wild country with mountain torrents dashing and foaming between their rugged sides. The clatter of waters, the scream of the eagle, and the howling of wolves the only sounds which broke upon the silence in that dreary and inhospitable region. Through this wild country it was that Sir Nigel and his company pushed their way, riding at times through vast defiles where the brown, gnarled cliffs shot up on either side of them and the sky was but a long winding blue slit between the clustering lines of box which fringed the lips of the precipices, or, again leading their horses along the narrow and rocky paths worn by the muleteers upon the edges of the chasm, where under their very elbows they could see the white streak which marked the gave, which foamed a thousand feet below them. So for two days they pushed their way through the wild places of Navarre, past Fuente, over the rapid EGA, through Estella, until upon a winter's evening the mountains fell away from in front of them, and they saw the broad blue abro curving betwixt its double line of homesteads and of villages. The fishers of Viona were aroused that night by rough voices speaking in a strange tongue, and ere morning Sir Nigel and his men had ferried the river and were safe upon the land of Spain. All the next day they lay in a pine wood near to the town of Logrono, resting their horses and taking counsel as to what they should do. Sir Nigel had with him Sir William Felton, Sir Oliver Buttisthorne, stout old Sir Simon Burley, the Scotch knight errant, the Earl of Angus, and Sir Richard Corston, all accounted among the bravest knights in the army, together with sixty veteran men at arms, and three hundred and twenty archers. Spies had been sent out in the morning, and returned after nightfall to say that the King of Spain was in camp some fourteen miles off in the direction of Burgos having with him twenty thousand horse and four to five thousand foot. A drywood fire had been lit, and round this the leaders crouched, the glare beating upon their rugged faces, while the hardy archers lounged and chatted amid the tethered horses, while they munched their scanty provisions. For my part, said Sir Simon Burley, I am of opinion that we have already done that which we have come for. For do we not now know where the king is? and how great a following he hath, which was the end of our journey. True, answered Sir William Felton, but I have come on this venture because it is a long time since I have broken a spear in war, and, certes, I shall not go back until I have run a course with some cavalier of Spain. Let those go back who will, but I must see more of these Spaniards ere I turn. I will not leave you, Sir William, returned Sir Simon Burley. And yet, as an old soldier and one who hath seen much of war, I cannot but think that it is an ill thing for four hundred men to find themselves between an army of sixty thousand on the one side and a broad river on the other. Yet, said Sir Richard Corston, we cannot for the honour of England go back without a blow struck. Nor for the honour of Scotland either, cried the Earl of Angus. By Saint Andrew! I wish that I may never set eyes upon the water of Leith again if I pluck my horse's bridle ere I have seen this camp of theirs. By St. Paul. You have spoken very well, said Sir Nigel, and I have always heard that there were very worthy gentlemen among the Scots, and fine skirmishing to be had upon their border. Bethink you, Sir Simon, that we have this news from the lips of common spies, who can scarce tell us as much of the enemy and of his forces as the prince would wish to hear. 
You are the leader in this venture, Sir Nigel, the other answered, and I do but ride under your banner. Yet I would fain have your read and counsel, Sir Simon. But, touching what you say of the river, we can take heed that we shall not have it at the back of us, for the prince hath now advanced to Solvatiera, and thence to Vittoria, so that if we come upon their camp from the further side we can make good our retreat. What then would you propose? asked Sir Simon, shaking his grizzled head as one who is but half convinced. That we ride forward ere the news reach them that we have crossed the river. In this way we may have sight of their army, and perchance even find occasion for some small deed against them. So be it, then, said Sir Simon Burley, and the rest of the council having approved, a scanty meal was hurriedly snatched, and the advance resumed under the cover of the darkness. All night they led their horses, stumbling and groping through wild defiles and rugged valleys, following the guidance of a frightened peasant who was strapped by the wrist to Black Simon's stirrup leather. With the early dawn they found themselves in a black ravine, with others sloping away from it on either side, and the bare brown crags rising in long bleak terraces all round them. If it please you, fair lord, said Black Simon, this man hath misled us, and since there is no tree upon which we may hang him, it might be well to hurl him over yonder cliff. The peasant, reading the soldier's meaning in his fierce eyes and harsh accents dropped upon his knees, screaming loudly for mercy. How comes it, dog? asked Sir William Felton in Spanish. Where is this camp to which you swore that you would lead us? By the sweet virgin. By the blessed mother of God, cried the trembling peasant, I swear to you that in the darkness I have myself lost the path. Over the cliff with him, shouted half a dozen voices, but ere the archers could drag him from the rocks to which he clung Sir Nigel had ridden up and called upon them to stop. How is this, sirs, said he? As long as the prince doth me the honour to entrust this venture to me, it is for me only to give orders, and, by Saint Paul, I shall be right blithe to go very deeply into the matter with any one to whom my words may give offence. How say you, Sir William? Or you, my Lord of Angus? Or you, Sir Richard? Nay, nay, Nigel, cried Sir William. This base peasant is too small a matter for old comrades to quarrel over. But he hath betrayed us, and certes he hath merited a dog's death. Hark ye, fellow, said Sir Nigel. We give you one more chance to find the path. We are about to gain much honour, Sir William, in this enterprise, and it would be a sorry thing if the first blood shed were that of an unworthy boar. Let us say our morning orisons, and it may chance that ere we finish he may strike upon the track. With bowed heads and steel caps in hand, the archers stood at their horses' heads, while Sir Simon Burley repeated the pater, the ave, and the credo. Long did Aline bear the scene in mind, the knot of knights in their dull leaden-hued armour, the ruddy visage of Sir Oliver, the craggy features of the Scottish owl, the shining scalp of Sir Nigel, with the dense ring of hard, bearded faces and the long brown heads of the horses, all topped and circled by the beetling cliffs. Scarce had the last deep amen broken from the company, when, in an instant, there rose the scream of a hundred bugles, with the deep rolling of drums and the clashing of cymbals, all sounding together in one deafening uproar. Knights and archers sprang to arms, convinced that some great host was upon them, but the guide dropped upon his knees and thanked heaven for its mercies. We have found them, caballeros, he cried. This is their morning call. If ye will but deign to follow me, I will set them before you ere a man might tell his beads. As he spoke he scrambled down one of the narrow ravines, and, climbing over a low ridge at the further end, he led them into a short valley with a stream purling down the centre of it and a very thick growth of elder and of box upon either side. Pushing their way through the dense brushwood, they looked out upon a scene which made their hearts beat harder and their breath come faster. In front of them there lay a broad plain, watered by two winding streams and covered with grass, stretching away to where, in the furthest distance, the towers of Burgos bristled up against the light blue morning sky. Over all this vast meadow there lay a great city of tents, thousands upon thousands of them, laid out in streets and in squares like a well-ordered town. High silken pavilions or coloured marquees, 
shooting up from among the crowd of meaner dwellings, marked where the great lords and barons of Leon and Castile displayed their standards, while over the white roofs, as far as I could reach, the waving of ancients, pavons, pencils, and banderoles, with flash of gold and glow of colours, proclaimed that all the chivalry of Iberia were mustered in the plain beneath them. Far off, in the centre of the camp, a huge palace of red and white silk, with the royal arms of Castile waving from the summit, announced that the gallant Henry lay there in the midst of his warriors. As the English adventurers, peeping out from behind their brushwood screen, looked down upon this wondrous sight they could see that the vast army in front of them was already afoot. The first pink light of the rising sun glittered upon the steel caps and breastplates of dense masses of slingers and of crossbowmen, who drilled and marched in the spaces which had been left for their exercise. A thousand columns of smoke reeked up into the pure morning air where the faggots were piled and the camp kettles already simmering. In the open plain clouds of light horse galloped and swooped with swaying bodies and waving javelins, after the fashion which the Spanish had adopted from their Moorish enemies. All along by the sedgy banks of the rivers long lines of pages led their masters' chargers down to water, while the knights themselves lounged in gaily dressed groups about the doors of their pavilions, or rode out, with their falcons upon their wrists and their greyhounds behind them, in quest of quail or of leveret. By my hilt! Mongar, whispered Elwood to Aline, as the young squire stood with parted lips and wondering eyes, gazing down at the novel scene before him, we have been seeking them all night, but now that we have found them I know not what we are to do with them. You say sooth, Samkin, quoth old Johnston. I would that we were upon the far side of Ebro again, for there is neither honour nor profit to be gained here. What say you, Simon? By the rude, cried the fierce man-at-arms, I will see the colour of their blood ere I turn my mare's head for the mountains. Am I a child, that I should ride for three days and naught but words at the end of it? Well said, my sweet honeysuckle, cried Hordle John. I am with you, like hilt to blade. Could I but lay hands upon one of those gay prancers yonder, I doubt not that I should have ransom enough from him to buy my mother a new cow. A cow, said Elwood. Say rather ten acres and a homestead on the banks of Avon. Say you so? Then, by Our Lady. Here is for yonder one in the red jerkin. He was about to push recklessly forward into the open, when Sir Nigel himself darted in front of him, with his hand upon his breast. Back, said he. Our time is not yet come, and we must lie here until evening. Throw off your jacks and headpieces, least their eyes catch the shine, and tether the horses among the rocks. The order was swiftly obeyed, and in ten minutes the archers were stretched along by the side of the brook, munching the bread and the bacon which they had brought in their bags, and craning their necks to watch the ever-changing scene beneath them. Very quiet and still they lay, save for a muttered jest or whispered order, for twice during the long morning they heard bugle calls from amid the hills on either side of them, which showed that they had thrust themselves in between the outposts of the enemy. The leaders sat amongst the boxwood, and took counsel together as to what they should do, while from below there surged up the buzz of voices, the shouting, the neighing of horses, and all the uproar of a great camp. What boots it to wait, said Sir William Felton. Let us ride down upon their camp ere they discover us. And so say I, cried the Scottish Earl, for they do not know that there is any enemy within thirty long leagues of them. For my part, said Sir Simon Burley, I think that it is madness, for you cannot hope to rout this great army, and where are you to go and what are you to do when they have turned upon you? How say you, Sir Oliver Buttisthorn? By the apple of Eve, cried the fat knight, it appears to me that this wind brings a very savoury smell of garlic and of onions from their cooking kettles. I am in favour of riding down upon them at once, if my old friend and comrade here is of the same mind. Nay, said Sir Nigel, I have a plan by which we may attempt some small deed upon them, and yet, by the help of God, may be able to draw off again, which, as Sir Simon Burley hath said, would be scarce possible in any other way. How then, Sir Nigel, asked several voices. We shall lie here all day, 
for amid this brushwood it is ill for them to see us. Then when evening comes we shall sally out upon them and see if we may not gain some honourable advancement from them. But why then rather than now? Because we shall have nightfall to cover us when we draw off, so that we may make our way back through the mountains. I would station a score of archers here in the pass, with all our pennons jutting forth from the rocks, and as many knackers and drums and bugles as we have with us, so that those who follow us in the fading light may think that the whole army of the prince is upon them, and fear to go further. What think you of my plan, Sir Simon? By my troth. I think very well of it, cried the prudent old commander. If four hundred men must needs run a tilt against sixty thousand, I cannot see how they can do it better or more safely. And so say I, cried Felton, heartily. But I wish the day were over, for it will be an ill thing for us if they chance to light upon us. The words were scarce out of his mouth when there came a clatter of loose stones, the sharp clink of trotting hoofs, and a dark-faced cavalier, mounted upon a white horse, burst through the bushes and rode swiftly down the valley from the end which was farthest from the Spanish camp. Lightly armed, with his visor open and a hawk perched upon his left wrist, he looked about him with the careless air of a man who is bent wholly upon pleasure, and unconscious of the possibility of danger. Suddenly, however, his eyes lit upon the fierce faces which glared out at him from the brushwood. With a cry of terror, he thrust his spurs into his horse's sides and dashed for the narrow opening of the gorge. For a moment it seemed as though he would have reached it, for he had trampled over or dashed aside the archers who threw themselves in his way, but Hordle John seized him by the foot in his grasp of iron and dragged him from the saddle, while two others caught the frightened horse. Ho, ho, roared the great archer. How many cows walk by my mother, if I set thee free? Hush that bull's bellowing, cried Sir Nigel impatiently. Bring the man here. By St. Paul. It is not the first time that we have met, for, if I mistake not, it is Don Diego Alvarez, who was once at the prince's court. It is indeed I, said the Spanish knight, speaking in the French tongue, and I pray you to pass your sword through my heart, for how can I live I, a caballero of Castile after being dragged from my horse by the base hands of a common archer? Fret not for that answered Sir Nigel. For, in sooth, had he not pulled you down, a dozen cloth-yard shafts had crossed each other in your body. By St. James. It were better so than to be polluted by his touch, answered the Spaniard, with his black eyes sparkling with rage and hatred. I trust that I am now the prisoner of some honourable knight or gentleman. You are the prisoner of the man who took you, Sir Diego, answered Sir Nigel and I may tell you that better men than either you or I have found themselves before now prisoners in the hands of archers of England. What ransom, then, does he demand, asked the Spaniard. Big John scratched his red head and grinned in high delight when the question was propounded to him. Tell him, said he, that I shall have ten cows and a bull too, if it be but a little one. Also a dress of blue send all for mother and a red one for Joan with five acres of pasture land, two sides, and a fine new grindstone. Likewise a small house, with stalls for the cows, and thirty-six gallons of beer for the thirsty weather. Tut, tut, cried Sir Nigel, laughing. All these things may be had for money, and I think, Don Diego, that five thousand crowns is not too much for so renowned a knight. It shall be duly paid him. For some days we must keep you with us, and I must crave leave also to use your shield, your armour, and your horse. My harness is yours by the law of arms, said the Spaniard, gloomily. I do but ask the loan of it. I have need of it this day, but it shall be duly returned to you. Set guards, Elwood, with arrow on string, at either end of the pass, for it may happen that some other cavaliers may visit us ere the time be come. All day the little band of Englishmen lay in the sheltered gorge, looking down upon the vast host of their unconscious enemies. Shortly after midday, a great uproar of shouting and cheering broke out in the camp, with mustering of men and calling of bugles. Clambering up among the rocks, 
the companions saw a long rolling cloud of dust along the whole eastern skyline, with the glint of spears and the flutter of pennons, which announced the approach of a large body of cavalry. For a moment a wild hope came upon them that perhaps the prince had moved more swiftly than had been planned, that he had crossed the Ebro, and that this was his vanguard sweeping to the attack. Surely I see the red pile of Chandos at the head of yonder squadron, cried Sir Richard Corston, shading his eyes with his hand. Not so, answered Sir Simon Burley, who had watched the approaching host with a darkening face. It is even as I feared. That is the double eagle of Dugesclin. You say very truly, cried the Earl of Angus. These are the levies of France, for I can see the ensigns of the Marshal d'Andragon, with that of the Lord of Antoing and of Brazil, and of many another from Brittany and Anjou. By St. Paul. I am very glad of it, said Sir Nigel. Of these Spaniards I know nothing, but the French are very worthy gentlemen, and will do what they can for our advancement. They are at the least four thousand of them, and all men-at-arms, cried Sir William Felton. See, there is Bertrand himself, beside his banner, and there is King Henry, who rides to welcome him. Now they all turn and come into the camp together. As he spoke, the vast throng of Spaniards and of Frenchmen trooped across the plain, with brandished arms and tossing banners. All day long the sound of revelry and of rejoicing from the crowded camp swelled up to the ears of the Englishmen, and they could see the soldiers of the two nations throwing themselves into each other's arms and dancing hand in hand round the blazing fires. The sun had sunk behind a cloud bank in the west before Sir Nigel at last gave word that the men should resume their arms and have their horses ready. He had himself thrown off his armour, and had dressed himself from head to foot in the harness of the captured Spaniard. Sir William, said he, it is my intention to attempt a small deed, and I ask you therefore that you will lead this outfall upon the camp. For me, I will ride into their camp with my squire and two archers. I pray you to watch me, and to ride forth when I am come among the tents. You will leave twenty men behind here, as we planned this morning, and you will ride back here after you have ventured as far as seems good to you. I will do as you order, Nigel. But what is it that you propose to do? You will see anon, and indeed it is but a trifling matter. Aline, you will come with me, and lead a spare horse by the bridle. I will have the two archers who rode with us through France, for they are trusty men and of stout heart. Let them ride behind us, and let them leave their boughs here among the bushes for it is not my wish that they should know that we are Englishmen. Say no word to any whom we may meet, and, if any speak to you, Pass on as though you heard them not. Are you ready? I am ready, my fair lord, said Aline. And I, and I, cried Elwood and John. Then the rest I leave to your wisdom, Sir William, and if God sends us fortune we shall meet you again in this gorge ere it be dark. So saying, Sir Nigel mounted the white horse of the Spanish cavalier and rode quietly forth from his concealment with his three companions behind him, Aline leading his master's own steed by the bridle. So many small parties of French and Spanish horse were sweeping hither and thither that the small band attracted little notice, and making its way at a gentle trot across the plain, they came as far as the camp without challenge or hindrance. On and on they pushed past the endless lines of tents, amid the dense swarms of horsemen and of footmen, until the huge royal pavilion stretched in front of them. They were close upon it when of a sudden there broke out a wild hubbub from a distant portion of the camp, with screams and war cries and all the wild tumult of battle. At the sound soldiers came rushing from their tents, knights shouted loudly for their squires, and there was mad turmoil on every hand of bewildered men and plunging horses. At the royal tent a crowd of gorgeously dressed servants ran hither and thither in helpless panic for the guard of soldiers who were stationed there had already ridden off in the direction of the alarm. A man-at-arms on either side of the doorway were the sole protectors of the royal dwelling. I have come for the king, whispered Sir Nigel, and, by St. Paul, he must back with us or I must bide here. Aline and Elwood sprang from their horses and flew at the two sentries, who were disarmed and beaten down in an instant by so furious and unexpected an attack. 
Sir Nigel dashed into the royal tent, and was followed by Hordle John as soon as the horses had been secured. From within came wild screamings and the clash of steel, and then the two emerged once more, their swords and forearms reddened with blood, while John bore over his shoulder the senseless body of a man whose gay surcoat, adorned with the lions and towers of Castile, proclaimed him to belong to the royal house. A crowd of white-faced sores and pages swarmed at their heels, those behind pushing forwards, while the foremost shrank back from the fierce faces and reeking weapons of the adventurers. The senseless body was thrown across the spare horse, the four sprang to their saddles, and away they thundered with loose reins and busy spurs through the swarming camp. But confusion and disorder still reigned among the Spaniards for Sir William Felton and his men had swept through half their camp, leaving a long litter of the dead and the dying to mark their course. Uncertain who were their attackers, and unable to tell their English enemies from their newly arrived Breton allies, the Spanish knights rode wildly hither and thither in aimless fury. The mad turmoil, the mixture of races, and the fading light, were all in favour of the four who alone knew their own purpose among the vast uncertain multitude. Twice ere they reached open ground they had to break their way through small bodies of horses, and once there came a whistle of arrows and singing of stones about their ears, but, still dashing onwards, they shot out from among the tents and found their own comrades retreating for the mountains at no very great distance from them. Another five minutes of wild galloping over the plain, and they were all back in their gorge, while their pursuers fell back before the rolling of drums and blare of trumpets, which seemed to proclaim that the whole army of the prince was about to emerge from the mountain passes. By my soul! Nigel, cried Sir Oliver, waving a great ball term over his head, I have come by something which I may eat with my truffles. I had a hard fight for it, for there were three of them with their mouths open and the knives in their hands, all sitting agape round the table, when I rushed in upon them. How say you, Sir William, will you not try the smack of the famed Spanish swine, though we have but the brook water to wash it down? Later, Sir Oliver, answered the old soldier, wiping his grimed face. We must further into the mountains ere we be in safety. But what have we here, Nigel? It is a prisoner whom I have taken, and in sooth, as he came from the royal tent and wears the royal arms upon his dupon, I trust that he is the King of Spain. The King of Spain, cried the companions, crowding round in amazement. Nay, Sir Nigel, said Felton, peering at the prisoner through the uncertain light. I have twice seen Henry of Transtamere, and certes this man in no way resembles him. Then, by the light of heaven, I will ride back for him, cried Sir Nigel. Nay, nay, the camp is in arms, and it would be rank madness. Who are you, fellow, he added in Spanish, and how is it that you dare to wear the arms of Castile? The prisoner was bent recovering the consciousness which had been squeezed from him by the grip of Hordle John. If it please you, he answered, I and nine others are the body squires of the king, and must ever wear his arms, so as to shield him from even such perils as have threatened him this night. The king is at the tent of the brave Du Guesclin, where he will sup tonight. But I am a caballero of Aragon, Don Sancho Penalosa, and, though I be no king, I am yet ready to pay a fitting price for my ransom. By St. Paul. I will not touch your gold, cried Sir Nigel. Go back to your master and give him greeting from Sir Nigel Loring of Twinham Castle, telling him that I had hoped to make his better acquaintance this night, and that, if I have disordered his tent, it was but in my eagerness to know so famed and courteous a knight. Spur on, comrades. For we must cover many a league ere we can venture to light fire or to loosen girth. I had hoped to ride without this patch tonight, but it seems that I must carry it yet a little longer. Chapter 36 How Sir Nigel Took the Patch from His Eye It was a cold, bleak morning in the beginning of March, and the mist was drifting in dense rolling clouds through the passes of the Cantabrian Mountains. The company, who had passed the night in a sheltered gully, were already astir, some crowding round the blazing fires and others romping or leaping over each other's backs for their limbs were chilled and the air biting. Here and there, through the dense haze which surrounded them, there loomed out huge pinnacles and jutting boulders of rock, 
while high above the sea of vapor there towered up one gigantic peak, with the pink glow of the early sunshine upon its snow-capped head. The ground was wet, the rocks dripping, the grass, an evergreen sparkling with beads of moisture, yet the camp was loud with laughter and merriment, for a messenger had ridden in from the prince with words of heart-stirring praise for what they had done, and with orders that they should still abide in the forefront of the army. Round one of the fires were clustered four or five of the leading men of the archers, cleaning the rust from their weapons, and glancing impatiently from time to time at a great pot which smoked over the blaze. There was Elwood squatting cross-legged in his shirt, while he scrubbed away at his chainmail brigandine, whistling loudly the while. On one side of him sat old Johnston, who was busy in trimming the feathers of some arrows to his liking, and on the other hordle John, who lay with his great limbs all asprawl, and his headpiece balanced upon his uplifted foot. Black Simon of Norwich crouched amid the rocks, crooning an Eastland ballad to himself, while he wetted his sword upon a flat stone which lay across his knees, while beside him sat Aline Edrickson, and Norbury, the silent squire of Sir Oliver, holding out their chilled hands towards the crackling faggots. Cast on another culpin, John, and stir the broth with thy sword sheath, growled Johnston, looking anxiously for the twentieth time at the reeking pot. By my hilt, cried Elwood, now that John hath come by this great ransom, he will scarce abide the fare of poor archer lads. How say you, camarade? When you see Hordal once more, there will be no penny ale and fat bacon, but Gascon wines and baked meats every day of the seven. I know not about that, said John, kicking his helmet up into the air and catching it in his hand. I do but know that whether the broth be ready or no, I am about to dip this into it. It simmers and it boils, cried Johnston, pushing his hard-lined face through the smoke. In an instant the pot had been plucked from the blaze, and its contents had been scooped up in half a dozen steel headpieces, which were balanced betwixt their owner's knees, while, with spoon and gobbet of bread, they devoured their morning meal. It is ill weather for bows, remarked John at last, when, with a long sigh, he drained the last drop from his helmet. My strings are as limp as a cow's tail this morning. You should rub them with water glue, quoth Johnston. You remember, Samkin, that it was wetter than this on the morning of Creasy, and yet I cannot call to mind that there was aught amiss with our strings. It is in my thoughts, said Black Simon, still pensively grinding his sword, that we may have need of your strings ere sundown. I dreamed of the red cow last night. And what is this red cow, Simon, asked Aline. I know not, young sir, but I can only say that on the eve of Cadsand, and on the eve of Creasy, and on the eve of Nogent, I dreamed of a red cow, and now the dream has come upon me again, so I am now setting a very keen edge to my blade. Well said, old war dog, cried Elwood. By my hilt. I pray that your dream may come true, for the prince hath not set us out here to drink broth or to gather whirtleberries. One more fight, and I am ready to hang up my bow, marry a wife, and take to the fire corner. But how now, Robin? Whom is it that you seek? The Lord Loring craves your attendance in his tent, said a young archer to Aline. The squire rose and proceeded to the pavilion, where he found the knight seated upon a cushion with his legs crossed in front of him and a broad ribbon of parchment laid across his knees, over which he was poring with frowning brows and pursed lips. It came this morning by the prince's messenger, said he, and was brought from England by Sir John Fallis Lee, who is new come from Sussex. What make you of this upon the outer side? It is fairly and clearly written, Aline answered, and it signifies to Sir Nigel Loring, Knight Constable of Twinham Castle, by the hand of Christopher, the servant of God at the Priory of Christ Church. So I read it, said Sir Nigel. Now I pray you to read what is set forth within. Aline turned to the letter, and, as his eyes rested upon it, his face turned pale and a cry of surprise and grief burst from his lips. What then? asked the knight, peering up at him anxiously. There is naught amiss with the Lady Mary or with the Lady Maud. It is my brother, my poor unhappy brother, cried Aline, with his hand to his brow. 
he is dead. By St. Paul. I have never heard that he had shown so much love for you that you should mourn him so. Yet he was my brother, the only kith or kin that I had upon earth. Mayhap he had cause to be bitter against me, for his land was given to the abbey for my upbringing. Alas! Alas! And I raised my staff against him when last we met. He has been slain, and slain, I fear, amidst crime and violence. Ha! said Sir Nigel. Read on, I pray you. God be with thee, my honoured lord, and have thee in his holy keeping. The Lady Loring hath asked me to set down in writing what hath befallen at Twinham, and all that concerns the death of thy ill neighbour the Sockman of Minstead. For when ye had left us, this evil man gathered around him all outlaws, villains, and masterless men, until they were come to such a force that they slew and scattered the king's men who went against them. Then, coming forth from the woods, they laid siege to thy castle, and for two days they girt us in and shot hard against us, with such numbers as were a marvel to see. Yet the Lady Loring held the place stoutly, and on the second day the Sockman was slain, by his own men, as some think, so that we were delivered from their hands, for which praise be to all the saints, and more especially to the holy Anselm, upon whose feast it came to pass. The Lady Loring, and the Lady Maud, thy fair daughter, are in good health, and so also am I, save for an imposthume of the toe joint, which hath been sent me for my sins. May all the saints preserve thee. It was the vision of the Lady Typhane, said Sir Nigel, after a pause. Marked you not how she said that the leader was one with a yellow beard, and how he fell before the gate? But how came it, Aline, that this woman, to whom all things are as crystal, and who hath not said one word which has not come to pass, was yet so led astray as to say that your thoughts turned to Twinham Castle even more than my own? My fair lord, said Aline, with a flush on his weather-stained cheeks, the Lady Typhane may have spoken sooth when she said it, for Twinham Castle is in my heart by day and in my dreams by night. Ha! cried Sir Nigel, with a sidelong glance. Yes, my fair lord, for indeed I love your daughter, the Lady Maud, and, unworthy as I am, I would give my heart's blood to serve her. By St. Paul. Edrickson, said the knight coldly, arching his eyebrows, you aim high in this matter. Our blood is very old. And mine also is very old, answered the squire. And the Lady Maud is our single child. All our name and land centre upon her. Alas! That I should say it, but I also am now the only Edrickson. And why have I not heard this from you before, Aline? In sooth, I think that you have used me ill. Nay, my fair lord, say not so, for I know not whether your daughter loves me, and there is no pledge between us. Sir Nigel pondered for a few moments, and then burst out a laughing. By St. Paul, said he, I know not why I should mix in the matter, for I have ever found that the Lady Maud was very well able to look to her own affairs. Since first she could stamp her little foot, she hath ever been able to get that for which she craved, and if she set her heart on thee, Aline, and thou on her, I do not think that this Spanish king, with his three score thousand men, could hold you apart. Yet this I will say, that I would see you a full night ere you go to my daughter with words of love. I have ever said that a brave lance should wed her, and, by my soul. Edrickson, if God spare you, I think that you will acquit yourself well. But enough of such trifles, for we have our work before us, and it will be time to speak of this matter when we see the white cliffs of England once more. Go to Sir William Felton, I pray you, and ask him to come hither, for it is time that we were marching. There is no pass at the further end of the valley, and it is a perilous place should an enemy come upon us. Aline delivered his message, and then wandered forth from the camp for his mind was all in a whirl with this unexpected news, and with his talk with Sir Nigel. Sitting upon a rock, with his burning brow resting upon his hands, he thought of his brother, of their quarrel, of the Lady Maud in her bedraggled riding dress, of the grey old castle, of the proud pale face in the armory, and of the last fiery words with which she had sped him on his way. 
Then he was but a penniless, monk-bred lad, unknown and unfriended. Now he was himself Sockman of Minstead, the head of an old stock, and the lord of an estate which, if reduced from its former size, was still ample to preserve the dignity of his family. Further, he had become a man of experience, was counted brave among brave men, had won the esteem and confidence of her father, and, above all, had been listened to by him when he told him the secret of his love. As to the gaining of knighthood, in such stirring times it was no great matter for a brave squire of gentle birth to aspire to that honour. He would leave his bones among these Spanish ravines, or he would do some deed which would call the eyes of men upon him. Aline was still seated on the rock, his griefs and his joys drifting swiftly over his mind like the shadow of clouds upon a sunlit meadow, when of a sudden he became conscious of a low, deep sound which came booming up to him through the fog. Close behind him he could hear the murmur of the bowmen, the occasional bursts of horse laughter, and the champing and stamping of their horses. Behind it all, however, came that low-pitched, deep-toned hum, which seemed to come from every quarter and to fill the whole air. In the old monastic days he remembered to have heard such a sound when he had walked out one windy night at Buckleshard, and had listened to the long waves breaking upon the shingly shore. Here, however, was neither wind nor sea, and yet the dull murmur rose ever louder and stronger out of the heart of the rolling sea of vapour. He turned and ran to the camp, shouting an alarm at the top of his voice. It was but a hundred paces, and yet ere he had crossed it every bowman was ready at his horse's head, and the group of knights were out and listening intently to the ominous sound. It is a great body of horse, said Sir William Felton, and they are riding very swiftly hitherwards. Yet they must be from the prince's army, remarked Sir Richard Corston, for they come from the north. Nay, said the Earl of Angus, it is not so certain for the peasant with whom we spoke last night said that it was rumoured that Don Teo, the Spanish king's brother, had ridden with six thousand chosen men to beat up the prince's camp. It may be that on their backward road they have come this way. By St. Paul, cried Sir Nigel, I think that it is even as you say, for that same peasant had a sour face and a shifting eye, as one who bore us little goodwill. I doubt not that he has brought these cavaliers upon us. But the mist covers us, said Sir Simon Burley. We have yet time to ride through the further end of the pass. Were we a troop of mountain goats we might do so, answered Sir William Felton, but it is not to be passed by a company of horsemen. If these be indeed Don Teo and his men, then we must bide where we are, and do what we can to make them rue the day that they found us in their path. Well spoken, William, cried Sir Nigel, in high delight. If there be so many as has been said, then there will be much honour to be gained from them and every hope of advancement. But the sound has ceased, and I fear that they have gone some other way. Or mayhap they have come to the mouth of the gorge, and are marshalling their ranks. Hush and hearken! For they are no great way from us. The company stood peering into the dense fog wreath, amidst a silence so profound that the dripping of the water from the rocks and the breathing of the horses grew loud upon the ear. Suddenly from out the sea of mist came the shrill sound of a neigh, followed by a long blast upon a bugle. It is a Spanish call, my fair lord, said Black Simon. It is used by their prickers and huntsmen when the beast hath not fled, but is still in its lair. By my faith, said Sir Nigel, smiling, if they are in a humour for venery we may promise them some sport ere they sound the mort over us. But there is a hill in the centre of the gorge on which we might take our stand. I marked it yesternight, said Felton, and no better spot could be found for our purpose, for it is very steep at the back. It is but a bowshot to the left, and, indeed, I can see the shadow of it. The whole company, leading their horses, passed across to the small hill which loomed in front of them out of the mist. It was indeed admirably designed for defence, for it sloped down in front, all jagged and boulder-strewn, while it fell away in a sheer cliff of a hundred feet or more. On the summit was a small uneven plateau, with a stretch across of a hundred paces, and a depth of half as much again. Unloose the horses, said Sir Nigel. We have no space for them, 
and if we hold our own we shall have horses and to spare when this day's work is done. Nay, keep yours, my fair sirs, for we may have work for them. Elwood, Johnston, let your men form a harrow on either side of the ridge. Sir Oliver and you, my Lord Angus, I give you the right wing, and the left to you, Sir Simon, and to you, Sir Richard Corston. I and Sir William Felton will hold the centre with our men-at-arms. Now order the ranks, and fling wide the banners, for our souls are gods and our bodies the kings, and our swords for St. George and for England. Sir Nigel had scarcely spoken when the mist seemed to thin in the valley, and to shred away into long ragged clouds which trailed from the edges of the cliffs. The gorge in which they had camped was a mere wedge-shaped cleft among the hills, three-quarters of a mile deep, with the small rugged rising upon which they stood at the further end, and the brown crags walling it in on three sides. As the mist parted, and the sun broke through, it gleamed and shimmered with dazzling brightness upon the armour and headpieces of a vast body of horsemen who stretched across the barranca from one cliff to the other, and extended backwards until their rear guard were far out upon the plain beyond. Line after line, and rank after rank, they choked the neck of the valley with a long vista of tossing pennons, twinkling lances, waving plumes and streaming banderoles, while the curvets and gambades of the chargers lent a constant motion and shimmer to the glittering, many-coloured mass. A yell of exultation, and a forest of waving steel through the length and breadth of their column, announced that they could at last see their entrapped enemies, while the swelling notes of a hundred bugles and drums, mixed with the clash of Moorish cymbals, broke forth into a proud peal of martial triumph. Strange it was to these gallant and sparkling cavaliers of Spain to look upon this handful of men upon the hill, the thin lines of bowmen, the knots of knights and men-at-arms with armour rusted and discoloured from long service, and to learn that these were indeed the soldiers whose fame and prowess had been the campfire talk of every army in Christum. Very still and silent they stood, leaning upon their bows, while their leaders took counsel together in front of them. No clang of bugle rose from their stern ranks, but in the centre waved the leopards of England, on the right the ensign of their company with the roses of Loring, and on the left, over three score of Welsh bowmen, there floated the red banner of Merlin with the boar's heads of the Buttisthorns. Gravely and sedately they stood beneath the morning sun waiting for the onslaught of their foemen. By St. Paul, said Sir Nigel, gazing with puckered eye down the valley, there appear to be some very worthy people among them. What is this golden banner which waves upon the left? It is the ensign of the Knights of Calatrava, answered Felton. And the other upon the right? It marks the Knights of Santiago, and I see by his flag that their grandmaster rides at their head. There too is the banner of Castilla mid yonder sparkling squadron which heads the main battle. There are six thousand men at arms with ten squadrons of slingers as far as I may judge their numbers. There are Frenchmen among them, my fair lord, remarked Black Simon. I can see the pennons of de Cuvette, de Brieu, Saint Paul, and many others who struck in against us for Charles of Blois. You are right, said Sir William, for I can also see them. There is much Spanish blazonry also, if I could but read it. Don Diego, you know the arms of your own land. Who are they who have done us this honour? The Spanish prisoner looked with exultant eyes upon the deep and serried ranks of his countrymen. By St. James, said he, if ye fall this day ye fall by no mean hands, for the flower of the knighthood of Castile ride under the banner of Don Teo, with the chivalry of Asturias, Toledo, Leon, Cordova, Galicia, and Seville. I see the guidance of Albornez, Cacola, Rodriguez, Tavora, with the two great orders, and the knights of France and of Aragon. If you will take my read you will come to a composition with them, for they will give you such terms as you have given me. Nay, by St. Paul! It were pity if so many brave men were drawn together, and no little deed of arms to come of it. Ha! William, they advance upon us, and, by my soul! It is a sight that is worth coming over the seas to see. As he spoke, the two wings of the Spanish host, consisting of the Knights of Calatrava on the one side and of Santiago upon the other, came swooping swiftly down the valley, while the main body followed more slowly behind. 
five hundred paces from the English the two great bodies of horse crossed each other, and, sweeping round in a curve, retired in feigned confusion towards their centre. Often in bygone wars had the Moors tempted the hot-blooded Spaniards from their places of strength by such pretended flights, but there were men upon the hill to whom every ruse and trick of war were as their daily trade and practice. Again and even nearer came the rallying Spaniards, and again with cry of fear and stooping bodies they swerved off to right and left, but the English still stood stolid and observant among their rocks. The vanguard halted a long bow shot from the hill, and with waving spears and vaunting shouts challenged their enemies to come forth, while two cavaliers, pricking forward from the glittering ranks, walked their horses slowly between the two arrays with targets braced and lances in rest like the challengers in a tourney. By St. Paul, cried Sir Nigel, with his one eye glowing like an ember, these appear to be two very worthy and debonair gentlemen. I do not call to mind when I have seen any people who seemed of so great a heart and so high of enterprise. We have our horses, Sir William, shall we not relieve them of any vow which they may have upon their souls? Felton's reply was to bound upon his charger, and to urge it down the slope, while Sir Nigel followed not three spears lengths behind him. It was a rugged course, rocky and uneven, yet the two knights, choosing their men, dashed onwards at the top of their speed, while the gallant Spaniards flew as swiftly to meet them. The one to whom Felton found himself opposed was a tall stripling with a stag's head upon his shield, while Sir Nigel's man was broad and squat with plain steel harness, and a pink and white torse bound round his helmet. The first struck Felton on the target with such force as to split it from side to side, but Sir William's lance crashed through the camel which shielded the Spaniard's throat, and he fell, screaming hoarsely, to the ground. Carried away by the heat and madness of fight, the English knight never drew rein, but charged straight on into the array of the knights of Calatrava. Long time the silent ranks upon the hill could see a swirl and eddy deep down in the heart of the Spanish column, with a circle of rearing charges and flashing blades. Here and there tossed the white plume of the English helmet, rising and falling like the foam upon a wave with the fierce gleam and sparkle ever circling round it until at last it had sunk from view, and another brave man had turned from war to peace. Sir Nigel, meanwhile, had found a foeman worthy of his steel for his opponent was none other than Sebastian Gomez, the picked lance of the monkish knights of Santiago, who had won fame in a hundred bloody combats with the Moors of Andalusia. So fierce was their meeting that their spears shivered up to the very grasp, and the horses reared backwards until it seemed that they must crash down upon their riders. Yet with consummate horsemanship they both swung round in a long curvet, and then plucking out their swords they lashed at each other like two lusty smiths hammering upon an anvil. The chargers spun round each other, biting and striking, while the two blades wheeled and whizzed and circled in gleams of dazzling light. Cut, parry, and thrust followed so swiftly upon each other that the eye could not follow them until at last coming thigh to thigh, they cast their arms around each other and rolled off their saddles to the ground. The heavier Spaniard threw himself upon his enemy, and pinning him down beneath him raised his sword to slay him, while a shout of triumph rose from the ranks of his countrymen. But the fatal blow never fell, for even as his arm quivered before descending, the Spaniard gave a shudder, and stiffening himself rolled heavily over upon his side with the blood gushing from his armpit and from the slit of his visor. Sir Nigel sprang to his feet with his bloody dagger in his left hand and gazed down upon his adversary, but that fatal and sudden stab in the vital spot, which the Spaniard had exposed by raising his arm, had proved instantly mortal. The Englishman leaped upon his horse and made for the hill, at the very instant that a yell of rage from a thousand voices and the clang of a score of bugles announced the Spanish onset. But the islanders were ready and eager for the encounter. With feet firmly planted, their sleeves rolled back to give free play to their muscles, their long yellow bow staves in their left hands, and their quivers slung to the front, they had waited in the four-deep harrow formation which gave strength to their array, and yet permitted every man to draw his arrow freely without harm to those in front. Elwood and Johnston had been engaged in throwing light tufts of grass into the air to gauge the wind force and a hoarse whisper passed down the ranks from the file leaders to the men, with scraps of advice and admonition. 
Do not shoot outside the 15 score paces, cried Johnston. We may need all our shafts ere we have done with them. Better to overshoot than to undershoot, added Elwood. Better to strike the rear guard than to feather a shaft in the earth. Loose quick and sharp when they come, added another. Let it be the eye to the string, the string to the shaft, and the shaft to the mark. By Our Lady. Their banners advance, and we must hold our ground now if ever we are to see Southampton water again. Aleem, standing with his sword drawn amidst the arches, saw a long toss and heave of the glittering squadrons. Then the front ranks began to surge slowly forward, to trot, to canter, to gallop, and in an instant the whole vast array was hurtling onward, line after line, the air full of the thunder of their cries, the ground shaking with the beat of their hoofs, the valley choked with the rushing torrent of steel, topped by the waving plumes, the slanting spears and the fluttering banderoles. On they swept over the level and up to the slope, ere they met the blinding storm of the English arrows. Down went the whole ranks in a whirl of mad confusion, horses plunging and kicking, bewildered men falling, rising, staggering on all back, while ever new lines of horsemen came spurring through the gaps and urged their charges up the fatal slope. All around him Aline could hear the stern, short orders of the master bowmen, while the air was filled with the keen twanging of the strings and the swish and patter of the shafts. Right across the foot of the hill there had sprung up a long wall of struggling horses and stricken men, which ever grew and heightened as fresh squadrons poured on the attack. One young knight on a grey jennet leaped over his fallen comrades and galloped swiftly up the hill, shrieking loudly upon St. James, ere he fell within a spear length of the English line, with the feathers of arrows thrusting out from every crevice and joint of his armour. So for five long minutes the gallant horsemen of Spain and of France drove ever and again to force a passage, until the wailing note of a bugle called them back, and they rode slowly out of bowshot, leaving their best and their bravest in the ghastly, blood-mottled heap behind them. But there was little rest for the victors. Whilst the knights had charged them in front the slingers had crept round upon either flank and had gained a footing upon the cliffs and behind the outlying rocks. A storm of stones broke suddenly upon the defenders, who, drawn up in lines upon the exposed summit, offered a fair mark to their hidden foes. Johnston, the old archer, was struck upon the temple and fell dead without a groan, while fifteen of his bowmen and six of the men-at-arms were struck down at the same moment. The others lay on their faces to avoid the deadly hail, while at each side of the plateau a fringe of bowmen exchanged shots with the slingers and crossbowmen among the rocks, aiming mainly at those who had swarmed up the cliffs, and bursting into laughter and cheers when a well-aimed shaft brought one of their opponents toppling down from his lofty perch. I think, Nigel, said Sir Oliver, striding across to the little knight, that we should all acquit ourselves better had we our none meet, for the sun is high in the heaven. By St. Paul, quoth Sir Nigel, plucking the patch from his eye, I think that I am now clear of my vow, for this Spanish knight was a person from whom much honour might be won. Indeed, he was a very worthy gentleman, of good courage, and great hardiness, and it grieves me that he should have come by such a hurt. As to what you say of food, Oliver, it is not to be thought of, for we have nothing with us upon the hill. Nigel, cried Sir Simon Burley, Hurrying up with consternation upon his face, Elwood tells me that there are not ten score arrows left in all their sheaves. See? They are springing from their horses, and cutting their salarets that they may rush upon us. Might we not even now make a retreat? My soul will retreat from my body first, cried the little knight. Here I am, and here I bide, while God gives me strength to lift a sword. And so say I, shouted Sir Oliver, throwing his mace high into the air and catching it again by the handle. To your arms, men, roared Sir Nigel. Shoot while you may, and then out sword, and let us live or die together. Chapter 37 How the White Company Came to be Disbanded Then uprose from the hill in the rugged Cantabrian valley a sound such as had not been heard in those parts before nor was again, until the streams which rippled amid the rocks had been frozen by over four hundred winters and thawed by as many returning springs. Deep and full and strong it thundered down the ravine, the fierce battle call of a warrior race, 
The last stern welcome to whoso should join with them in that world old game where the stake is death. Thrice it swelled forth and thrice it sank away, echoing and reverberating amidst the crags. Then, with set faces, the company rose up among the storm of stones, and looked down upon the thousands who sped swiftly up the slope against them. Horse and spear had been set aside, but on foot, with sword and battle-axe, their broad shields slung in front of them, the chivalry of Spain rushed to the attack. And now arose a struggle so fell, so long, so evenly sustained, that even now the memory of it is handed down amongst the Cantabrian mountaineers and the ill-omened knoll is still pointed out by fathers to their children as the Ultra de los Inglesos, where the men from across the sea fought the great fight with the Knights of the South. The last arrow was quickly shot, nor could the slingers hurl their stones, so close were friend and foe. From side to side stretched the thin line of the English, lightly armed and quick-footed, while against it stormed and raged the pressing throng of fiery Spaniards and of gallant Bretons. The clink of crossing sword blades, the dull thudding of heavy blows, the panting and gasping of weary and wounded men, all rose together in a wild, long-drawn note, which swelled upwards to the ears of the wandering peasants who looked down from the edges of the cliffs upon the swaying turmoil of the battle beneath them. Back and forward reeled the leopard banner, now borne up the slope by the rush and weight of the onslaught, now pushing downwards again as Sir Nigel, Burley, and Black Simon with their veteran men-at-arms, flung themselves madly into the fray. Aline, at his lord's right hand, found himself swept hither and thither in the desperate struggle, exchanging savage thrusts one instant with a Spanish cavalier, and the next torn away by the whirl of men and dashed up against some new antagonist. To the right Sir Oliver, Elwood, Hordel John, and the bowmen of the company fought furiously against the monkish knights of Santiago, who were led up the hill by their prior a great, deep-chested man, who wore a brown monastic habit over his suit of mail. Three archers he slew in three giant strokes, but Sir Oliver flung his arms round him, and the two, staggering and straining, reeled backwards and fell, locked in each other's grasp, over the edge of the steep cliff which flanked the hill. In vain his knights stormed and raved against the thin line which barred their path, the sword of Elwood and the great axe of John gleamed in the forefront of the battle and huge jagged pieces of rock, hurled by the strong arms of the bowmen, crashed and hurtled amid their ranks. Slowly they gave back down the hill, the archers still hanging upon their skirts, with a long litter of writhing and twisted figures to mark the course which they had taken. At the same instant the Welshmen upon the left, led on by the Scotch Earl, had charged out from among the rocks which sheltered them, and by the fury of their outfall had driven the Spaniards in front of them in headlong flight down the hill. In the centre only things seemed to be going ill with the defenders. Black Simon was down, dying, as he would wish to have died, like a grim old wolf in its lair with a ring of his slain around him. Twice Sir Nigel had been overborne, and twice Aline had fought over him until he had staggered to his feet once more. Burley lay senseless, stunned by a blow from a mace, and half of the men-at-arms lay littered upon the ground around him. Sir Nigel's shield was broken, his crest shorn, his armour cut and smashed, and the visor torn from his helmet, yet he sprang hither and thither with light foot and ready hand, engaging two Bretons and a Spaniard at the same instant, thrusting, stooping, dashing in, springing out, while Aline still fought by his side, stemming with a handful of men the fierce tide which surged up against them. Yet it would have fared ill with them had not the archers from either side closed in upon the flanks of the attackers, and pressed them very slowly and foot by foot down the long slope, until they were on the plain once more where their fellows were already rallying for a fresh assault. But terrible indeed was the cost at which the last had been repelled. Of the 370 men who had held the crest, 172 were left standing, many of whom were sorely wounded and weak from loss of blood. Sir Oliver Buttisthorn, Sir Richard Corston, Sir Simon Burley, Black Simon, Johnston, 150 archers, and 47 men-at-arms had fallen while the pitiless hail of stones was already whizzing and piping once more about their ears, threatening every instant to further reduce their numbers. Sir Nigel looked about him at his shattered ranks, and his face flushed with a soldier's pride. By St. Paul, he cried, I have fought in many a little bickering, but never one that I would be more loath to have missed than this. 
But you are wounded, Aline. It is not, answered his squire, stanching the blood which dripped from a sword cut across his forehead. These gentlemen of Spain seem to be most courteous and worthy people. I see that they are already forming to continue this debate with us. Form up the bowmen two deep instead of four. By my faith. Some very brave men have gone from among us. Elwood, you are a trusty soldier, for all that your shoulder has never felt accolade, nor your heels worn the gold spurs. Do you take charge of the right, I will hold the center, and you, my lord of Angus, the left. Ho! For Sir Samkin Elwood, cried a rough voice among the archers, and a roar of laughter greeted their new leader. By my hilt, said the old bowman, I never thought to lead a wing in a stricken field. Stand close, camaradess, for, by these finger bones. We must play the man this day. Come hither, Aleem, said Sir Nigel, walking back to the edge of the cliff which formed the rear of their position. And you, Norbury, he continued, beckoning to the squire of Sir Oliver, do you also come here? The two squires hurried across to him, and the three stood looking down into the rocky ravine which lay a hundred and fifty feet beneath them. The prince must hear of how things are with us, said the knight. Another onfall we may withstand, but they are many and we are few, so that the time must come when we can no longer form line across the hill. Yet if help were brought us we might hold the crest until it comes. See yonder horses which stray among the rocks beneath us. I see them, my fair lord. And see yonder path which winds along the hill upon the further end of the valley. I see it. Were you on those horses, and riding up yonder track, steep and rough as it is, I think that you might gain the valley beyond. Then on to the prince, and tell him how we fare. But, my fair lord, how can we hope to reach the horses, asked Norbury. Ye cannot go round to them, for they would be upon ye ere ye could come to them. Think ye that ye have heart enough to clamber down this cliff? Had we but a rope. There is one here. It is but one hundred feet long, and for the rest ye must trust to God unto your fingers. Can you try it, Aline? With all my heart, my dear lord, but how can I leave you in such a strait? Nay, it is to serve me that ye go. And you, Norbury? The silent squire said nothing, but he took up the rope, and, having examined it, he tied one end firmly round a projecting rock. Then he cast off his breastplate, thigh pieces, and greaves, while Aline followed his example. Tell Chandos, or Calverley, or Knowles, should the prince have gone forward, cried Sir Nigel. Now may God speed ye, for ye are brave and worthy men. It was, indeed, a task which might make the heart of the bravest sink within him. The thin cord dangling down the face of the brown cliff seemed from above to reach little more than halfway down it. Beyond stretched the rugged rock, wet and shining, with a green tuft here and there thrusting out from it, but little sign of ridge or foothold. Far below the jagged points of the boulders bristled up, dark and menacing. Norbury tugged thrice with all his strength upon the cord, and then lowered himself over the edge, while a hundred anxious faces peered over at him as he slowly clambered downwards to the end of the rope. Twice he stretched out his foot, and twice he failed to reach the point at which he aimed, but even as he swung himself for a third effort a stone from a sling buzzed like a wasp from amid the rocks and struck him full upon the side of his head. His grasp relaxed, his feet slipped, and in an instant he was a crushed and mangled corpse upon the sharp ridges beneath him. If I have no better fortune, said Aline, leading Sir Nigel aside. I pray you, my dear lord, that you will give my humble service to the Lady Maud, and say to her that I was ever her true servant and most unworthy cavalier. The old knight said no word, but he put a hand on either shoulder, and kissed his squire, with the tears shining in his eyes. Aline sprang to the rope, and sliding swiftly down, soon found himself at its extremity. From above it seemed as though rope and cliff were well nigh touching, but now, when swinging a hundred feet down, the squire found that he could scarce reach the face of the rock with his foot, 
and that it was as smooth as glass, with no resting place where a mouse could stand. Some three feet lower, however, his eye lit upon a long jagged crack which slanted downwards, and this he must reach if he would save not only his own poor life, but that of the eight score men above him. Yet it were madness to spring for that narrow slit with naught but the wet, smooth rock to cling to. He swung for a moment, full of thought, and even as he hung there another of the hellish stones sang through his curls, and struck a chip from the face of the cliff. Up he clambered a few feet, drew up the loose end after him, unslung his belt, held on with knee and with elbow while he spliced the long, tough leathern belt to the end of the cord, then lowering himself as far as he could go, he swung backwards and forwards until his hand reached the crack, when he left the rope and clung to the face of the cliff. Another stone struck him on the side, and he heard a sound like a breaking stick, with a keen stabbing pain which shot through his chest. Yet it was no time now to think of pain or ache. There was his lord and his eight-score comrades, and they must be plucked from the jaws of death. On he clambered, with his hand shuffling down the long sloping crack, sometimes bearing all his weight upon his arms, at others finding some small shelf or tuft on which to rest his foot. Would he never pass over that fifty feet? He dared not look down and could but grope slowly onwards, his face to the cliff, his fingers clutching, his feet scraping and feeling for a support. Every vein and crack and mottling of that face of rock remained forever stamped upon his memory. At last, however, his foot came upon a broad resting place and he ventured to cast a glance downwards. Thank God! He had reached the highest of those fatal pinnacles upon which his comrade had fallen. Quickly now he sprang from rock to rock until his feet were on the ground, and he had his hand stretched out for the horse's rein, when a slingstone struck him on the head, and he dropped senseless upon the ground. An evil blow it was for Aleem, but a worse one still for him who struck it. The Spanish slinger, seeing the youth lie slain, and judging from his dress that he was no common man, rushed forward to plunder him, knowing well that the bowmen above him had expended their last shaft. He was still three paces, however, from his victim's side when John upon the cliff above plucked up a huge boulder, and, poising it for an instant, dropped it with fatal aim upon the slinger beneath him. It struck upon his shoulder, and hurled him, crushed and screaming, to the ground, while Aline, recalled to his senses by these shrill cries in his very ear, staggered onto his feet, and gazed wildly about him. His eyes fell upon the horses, grazing upon the scanty pasture, and in an instant all had come back to him his mission, his comrades, the need for haste. He was dizzy, sick, faint, but he must not die, and he must not tarry, for his life meant many lives that day. In an instant he was in his saddle and spurring down the valley. Loud rang the swift charger's hoofs over rock and reef, while the fire flew from the stroke of iron, and the loose stones showered up behind him. But his head was whirling round, the blood was gushing from his brow, his temple, his mouth. Ever keener and sharper was the deadly pain which shot like a red-hot arrow through his side. He felt that his eye was glazing, his senses slipping from him, his grasp upon the reins relaxing. Then with one mighty effort, he called up all his strength for a single minute. Stooping down, he loosened the stirrup straps, bound his knees tightly to his saddle flaps, twisted his hands in the bridle, and then, putting the gallant horse's head for the mountain path, he dashed the spurs in and fell forward fainting with his face buried in the course, Black Manet. Little could he ever remember of that wild ride. Half conscious, but ever with the one thought beating in his mind, he goaded the horse onwards, rushing swiftly down steep ravines over huge boulders, along the edges of black abysses. Dim memories he had of beetling cliffs, of a group of huts with wandering faces at the doors, of foaming, clattering water, and of a bristle of mountain beaches. Once, ere he had ridden far, he heard behind him three deep, sullen shouts, which told him that his comrades had set their faces to the foe once more. Then all was blank, until he woke to find kindly blue English eyes peering down upon him and to hear the blessed sound of his country's speech. They were but a foraging party, a hundred archers and as many men at arms, but their leader was Sir Hugh Calverley, and he was not a man to bide idle when good blows were to be had not three leagues from him.
A scout was sent flying with a message to the camp, and Sir Hugh, with his two hundred men, thundered off to the rescue. With them went Aline, still bound to his saddle, still dripping with blood, and swooning and recovering, and swooning once again. On they rode, and on, until, at last, topping a ridge, they looked down upon the fateful valley. Alas! And alas! For the sight that met their eyes. There, beneath them, was the bloodbath hill, and from the highest pinnacle there flaunted the yellow and white banner with the lions and the towers of the royal house of Castile. Up the long slope rushed ranks and ranks of men exultant, shouting, with waving pennons and brandished arms. Over the whole summit were dense throngs of knights, with no enemy that could be seen to face them, save only that at one corner of the plateau an eddy and swirl amid the crowded mass seemed to show that all resistance was not yet at an end. At the sight a deep groan of rage and of despair went up from the baffled rescuers, and, spurring on their horses, they clattered down the long and winding path which led to the valley beneath. But they were too late to avenge, as they had been too late to save. Long ere they could gain the level ground, the Spaniards, seeing them riding swiftly amid the rocks, and being ignorant of their numbers, drew off from the captured hill, and, having secured their few prisoners, rode slowly in a long column, with drum beating and cymbal clashing, out of the valley. Their rear ranks were already passing out of sight ere the newcomers were urging their panting, foaming horses up the slope which had been the scene of that long-drawn and bloody fight. And a fearsome sight it was that met their eyes. Across the lower end lay the dense heap of men and horses where the first arrow storm had burst. Above, the bodies of the dead and the dying French, Spanish, and Aragonese lay thick and thicker, until they covered the whole ground two and three deep in one dreadful tangle of slaughter. Above them lay the Englishmen in their lines, even as they had stood, and higher yet upon the plateau a wild medley of the dead of all nations, where the last deadly grapple had left them. In the further corner, under the shadow of a great rock, there crouched seven bowmen, with great John in the centre of them all wounded, weary, and in sorry case, but still unconquered, with their blood-stained weapons waving and their voices ringing a welcome to their countrymen. Aline rode across to John, while Sir Hugh Calverley followed close behind him. By St. George, cried Sir Hugh, I have never seen signs of so stern a fight, and I am right glad that we have been in time to save you. You have saved more than us, said John, pointing to the banner which leaned against the rock behind him. You have done nobly, cried the old free companion, gazing with a soldier's admiration at the huge frame and bold face of the archer. But why is it, my good fellow, that you sit upon this man? By the rude. I had forgot him, John answered, rising and dragging from under him no lesser person than the Spanish caballero, Don Diego Alvarez. This man, my fair lord, means to me a new house, ten cows, one bull if it be but a little one a grindstone, and I know not what besides, so that I thought it well to sit upon him, lest he should take a fancy to leave me. Tell me, John, cried Aline faintly, where is my dear lord, Sir Nigel Loring? He is dead, I fear. I saw them throw his body across a horse and ride away with it, but I fear the life had gone from him. Now woe worth me. And where is Elwood? He sprang upon a riderless horse and rode after Sir Nigel to save him. I saw them throng around him, and he is either taken or slain. Blow the bugles, cried Sir Hugh, with a scowling brow. We must back to camp, and ere three days I trust that we may see these Spaniards again. I would fain have ye all in my company. We are of the White Company. My fair lord, said John. Nay, the white company is here disbanded, answered Sir Hugh solemnly, looking round him at the lines of silent figures. Look to the brave squire, for I fear that he will never see the sun rise again. Chapter 38 Of the Home Coming to Hampshire It was a bright July morning for months after that fatal fight in the Spanish Barranca. A blue heaven stretched above, a green rolling plain undulated below, intersected with hedgerows and flecked with grazing sheep. The sun was yet low in the heaven, 
and the red cows stood in the long shadow of the elms, chewing the cud and gazing with great vacant eyes at two horsemen who were spurring it down the long white road which dipped and curved away back to where the towers and pinnacles beneath the flat-topped hill marked the old town of Winchester. Of the riders one was young, graceful, and fair, clad in plain doublet and hosen of blue Brussels cloth, which served to show his active and well-knit figure. A flat velvet cap was drawn forward to keep the glare from his eyes, and he rode with lips compressed and anxious face, as one who has much care upon his mind. Young as he was, and peaceful as was his dress, the dainty golden spurs which twinkled upon his heels proclaimed his knighthood, while a long seam upon his brow and a scar upon his temple gave a manly grace to his refined and delicate countenance. His comrade was a large, red-headed man upon a great black horse, with a huge canvas bag slung from his saddlebow, which jingled and clinked with every movement of his steed. His broad, brown face was lighted up by a continual smile, and he looked slowly from side to side with eyes which twinkled and shone with delight. Well might John rejoice, for was he not back in his native Hampshire, had he not Don Diego's five thousand crowns rasping against his knee, and above all was he not himself squire now to Sir Aline Edrickson, the young Sockman of Minstead lately knighted by the sword of the Black Prince himself, and esteemed by the whole army as one of the most rising of the soldiers of England. For the last stand of the company had been told throughout Christom wherever a brave deed of arms was loved, and honours had flowed in upon the few who had survived it. For two months Aline had wavered betwixt death and life, with a broken rib and a shattered head, yet youth and strength and a cleanly life were all upon his side, and he awoke from his long delirium to find that the war was over that the Spaniards and their allies had been crushed at Navarretta, and that the prince had himself heard the tale of his ride for succour and had come in person to his bedside to touch his shoulder with his sword and to ensure that so brave and true a man should die. If he could not live, within the order of chivalry. The instant that he could set foot to ground Aline had started in search of his lord, but no word could he hear of him, dead or alive, and he had come home now sad-hearted in the hope of raising money upon his estates and so starting upon his quest once more. Landing at London, he had hurried on with a mind full of care, for he had heard no word from Hampshire since the short note which had announced his brother's death. By the rude, cried John, looking around him exultantly, where have we seen since we left such noble cows, such fleecy sheep, grass so green, or a man so drunk as yonder rogue who lies in the gap of the hedge? Ah, John, Aline answered wearily, it is well for you, but I never thought that my homecoming would be so sad a one. My heart is heavy for my dear lord and for Elwood, and I know not how I may break the news to the Lady Mary and to the Lady Maud, if they have not yet had tidings of it. John gave a groan which made the horses shy. It is indeed a black business, said he. But be not sad, for I shall give half these crowns to my old mother and half will I add to the money which you may have, and so we shall buy that yellow cog wherein we sailed to Bordeaux, and in it we shall go forth and seek Sir Nigel. Aline smiled, but shook his head. Were he alive we should have had word of him ere now, said he. But what is this town before us? Why, it is Romsey, cried John. See the tower of the old grey church, and the long stretch of the nunnery. But here sits a very holy man, and I shall give him a crown for his prayers. Three large stones formed a rough cot by the roadside, and beside it, basking in the sun, sat the hermit, with clay-coloured face, dull eyes, and long withered hands. With crossed ankles and sunken head, he sat as though all his life had passed out of him, with the beads slipping slowly through his thin, yellow fingers. Behind him lay the narrow cell, clay-floored and damp, comfortless, profitless and sordid. Beyond it there lay amid the trees the wattle and daub hut of a labour, the door open, and the single room exposed to the view. The man ruddy and yellow-haired, stood leaning upon the spade wherewith he had been at work upon the garden patch. From behind him came the ripple of a happy woman's laughter, and two young urchins darted forth from the hut, bare-legged and tozy, while the mother, stepping out, laid her hand upon her husband's arm and watched the gambols of the children. The hermit frowned at the untoward noise which broke upon his prayers, 
but his brow relaxed as he looked upon the broad silver piece which John held out to him. There lies the image of our past and of our future, cried Aline, as they rode on upon their way. Now, which is better, to till God's earth, to have happy faces round one's knee, and to love and be loved, or to sit forever moaning over one's own soul, like a mother over a sick babe? I know not about that, said John, for it casts a great cloud over me when I think of such matters. But I know that my crown was well spent, for the man had the look of a very holy person. As to the other, there was naught holy about him that I could see, and it would be cheaper for me to pray for myself than to give a crown to one who spent his days in digging for lettuces. Aileen could answer there swung round the curve of the road a lady's carriage drawn by three horses abreast with a postillion upon the outer one. Very fine and rich it was, with beams painted and gilt, wheels and spokes carved in strange figures, and over all an arched cover of red and white tapestry. Beneath its shade there sat a stout and elderly lady in a pink coat hardy, leaning back among a pile of cushions, and plucking out her eyebrows with a small pair of silver tweezers. None could seem more safe and secure and at her ease than this lady, yet here also was a symbol of human life, for in an instant, even as Aline reined aside to let the carriage pass, a wheel flew out from among its fellows, and over it all toppled carving, tapestry and gilt in one wild heap, with the horses plunging, the postillion shouting, and the lady screaming from within. In an instant Aline and John were on foot, and had lifted her forth all in a shake with fear but little the worse for her mischance. Now woe worth me, she cried, and ill fall on Michael Easova of Romsey. For I told him that the pin was loose, and yet he must needs gainsay me, like the foolish daft that he is. I trust that you have taken no hurt, my fair lady, said Aleem, conducting her to the bank, upon which John had already placed a cushion. Nay, I have had no scaff, though I have lost my silver tweezers. Now, lack a day. Did God ever put breath into such a fool as Michael Easova of Romsey? But I am much beholden to you, gentle sirs. Soldiers ye are, as one may readily see. I am myself a soldier's daughter, she added, casting a somewhat languishing glance at John, and my heart ever goes out to a brave man. We are indeed fresh from Spain. Quoth Aline. From Spain, say you? Ah! It was an ill and sorry thing that so many should throw away the lives that heaven gave them. In sooth, it is bad for those who fall, but worse for those who bide behind. I have but now bid farewell to one who hath lost all in this cruel war. And how that, lady? She is a young damsel of these parts, and she goes now into a nunnery. Alack! It is not a year since she was the fairest maid from Avon to Itchen, and now it was more than I could abide to wait at Romsey Nunnery to see her put the white veil upon her face, for she was made for a wife and not for the cloister. Did you ever, gentle sir, hear of a body of men called the White Company over yonder? Surely so, cried both the comrades. Her father was the leader of it, and her lover served under him as squire. News hath come that not one of the company was left alive, and so, poor lamb, she if. Lady, cried Aline, with catching breath, is it the Lady Maud Loring of whom you speak? It is, in sooth. Maud? And in a nunnery? Did, then, the thought of her father's death so move her? Her father, cried the lady, smiling. Nay. Maud is a good daughter, but I think it was this young golden-haired squire of whom I have heard who has made her turn her back upon the world. And I stand talking here, cried Aline wildly. Come, John, come. Rushing to his horse, he swung himself into the saddle, and was off down the road in a rolling cloud of dust as fast as his good steed could bear him. Great had been the rejoicing amid the Romsey nuns when the Lady Maud Loring had craved admission into their order, for was she not sole child and heiress of the old knight, with farms and fiefs which she could bring to the great nunnery. Long and earnest had been the talks of the gaunt Lady Abbess, in which she had conjured the young novice to turn forever from the world, 
and to rest her bruised heart under the broad and peaceful shelter of the church. And now, when all was settled, and when Abbess and Lady Superior had had their will, it was but fitting that some pomp and show should mark the glad occasion. Hence was it that the good burghers of Romsey were all in the streets, that gay flags and flowers brightened the path from the nunnery to the church, and that a long procession wound up to the old arched door leading up the bride to these spiritual nuptials. There was lay sister Agatha with the high gold crucifix, and the three incense bearers, and the two and twenty garbed in white, who cast flowers upon either side of them and sang sweetly the while. Then, with four attendants, came the novice, her drooping head wreathed with white blossoms, and, behind, the abbess and her council of older nuns, who were already counting in their minds whether their own bailiff could manage the farms of Twinham, or whether a reeve would be needed beneath him, to draw the utmost from these new possessions which this young novice was about to bring them. But alas! For plots and plans when love and youth and nature, and above all, fortune are arrayed against them. Who is this travel-stained youth who dares to ride so madly through the lines of staring burghers? Why does he fling himself from his horse and stare so strangely about him? See how he has rushed through the incense bearers, thrust aside lay sister Agatha, scattered the two and twenty damosels who sang so sweetly, and he stands before the novice with his hands outstretched, and his face shining, and the light of love in his grey eyes. Her foot is on the very lintel of the church, and yet he bars the way, and she, she thinks no more of the wise words and holy read of the lady abbess, but she hath given a sobbing cry and hath fallen forward with his arms around her drooping body and her wet cheek upon his breast. A sorry sight this for the gaunt abbess, an ill lesson too for the stainless two and twenty who have ever been taught that the way of nature is the way of sin. But Maud and Aline care little for this. A dank, cold air comes out from the black arch before them. Without, the sun shines bright and the birds are singing amid the ivy on the drooping beaches. Their choice is made, and they turn away hand in hand, with their backs to the darkness and their faces to the light. Very quiet was the wedding in the old priory church at Christ Church, where Father Christopher read the service, and there were few to see save the Lady Loring and John, and a dozen bowmen from the castle. The Lady of Twinham had drooped and pined for weary months, so that her face was harsher and less comely than before, yet she still hoped on, for her Lord had come through so many dangers that she could scarce believe that he might be stricken down at last. It had been her wish to start for Spain and to search for him, but Aline had persuaded her to let him go in her place. There was much to look after, now that the lands of Minstead were joined to those of Twinham, and Aline had promised her that if she would but bide with his wife he would never come back to Hampshire again until he had gained some news, good or ill, of her lord and lover. The yellow cog had been engaged, with Goodwin Hortane in command, and a month after the wedding Aline rode down to Buckleshard to see if she had come round yet from Southampton. On the way he passed the fishing village of Pitts Deep, and marked that a little crayer or brig was tacking off the land, as though about to anchor there. On his way back, as he rode towards the village, he saw that she had indeed anchored, and that many boats were round her, bearing cargo to the shore. A bowshot from Pitts Deep there was an inn a little back from the road, very large and widespread, with a great green bush hung upon a pole from one of the upper windows. At this window he marked, as he rode up, that a man was seated who appeared to be craning his neck in his direction. Aline was still looking up at him, when a woman came rushing from the open door of the inn, and made as though she would climb a tree, looking back the while with a laughing face. Wondering what these doings might mean, Aline tied his horse to a tree, and was walking amid the trunks towards the inn, when there shot from the entrance a second woman who made also for the trees. Close at her heels came a burly, brown-faced man, who leaned against the doorpost and laughed loudly with his hand to his side, Ah, Miss Bells, he cried, and is it thus you treat me? Ah, Miss Petites. I swear by these finger bones that I would not hurt a hair of your pretty heads, but I have been among the black pain him, and, by my hilt, it does me good to look at your English cheeks. Come, drink a stoop of muscadine with me, Miss Angers for my heart is warm to be among ye again. At the sight of the man Aline had stood staring, but at the sound of his voice such a thrill of joy bubbled up in his heart that he had to bite his lip to keep himself from shouting outright. 
but a deeper pleasure yet was in store. Even as he looked, the window above was pushed outwards, and the voice of the man whom he had seen there came out from it. Elwood, cried the voice, I have seen just now a very worthy person come down the road, though my eyes could scarce discern whether he carried coat armour. I pray you to wait upon him and tell him that a very humble knight of England abides here, so that if he be in need of advancement, or have any small vow upon his soul, or desire to exalt his lady, I may help him to accomplish it. Elwood at this order came shuffling forward amid the trees, and in an instant the two men were clinging in each other's arms, laughing and shouting and patting each other in their delight, while old Sir Nigel came running with his sword, under the impression that some small bickering had broken out, only to embrace and be embraced himself, until all three were hoarse with their questions and outcries and congratulations. On their journey home through the woods Aline learnt their wondrous story, how, when Sir Nigel came to his senses, he with his fellow captive had been hurried to the coast, and conveyed by sea to their captor's castle, how upon the way they had been taken by a Barbary rover, and how they exchanged their light captivity for a seat on a galley bench and hard labour at the pirate's oars, how, in the port at Barbary, Sir Nigel had slain the Moorish captain, and had swum with Elwood to a small coaster which they had taken, and so made their way to England with a rich cargo to reward them for their toils. All this Aline listened to, until the dark keep of Twinham towered above them in the gloaming, and they saw the red sun lying athwart the rippling Avon. No need to speak of the glad hearts at Twinham Castle that night, nor of the rich offerings from out that Moorish cargo which found their way to the chapel of Father Christopher. Sir Nigel Lawing lived for many years, full of honour and laden with every blessing. He rode no more to the wars, but he found his way to every jousting within thirty miles, and the Hampshire youth treasured it as the highest honour when a word of praise fell from him as to their management of their horses, or their breaking of their lances. So he lived and so he died, the most revered and the happiest man in all his native shire. For Sir Aline Edrickson and for his beautiful bride the future had also naught but what was good. Twice he fought in France, and came back each time laden with honours. A high place at court was given to him, and he spent many years at Windsor under the second Richard and the fourth Henry, where he received the honour of the Garter, and won the name of being a brave soldier, a true-hearted gentleman, and a great lover and patron of every art and science which refines or ennobles life. As to John, he took unto himself a village maid, and settled in Lyndhurst, where his five thousand crowns made him the richest Franklin for many miles around. For many years he drank his ale every night at the Pied Merlin, which was now kept by his friend Elwood, who had wedded the good widow to whom he had committed his plunder. The strong men and the bowmen of the country round used to drop in there of an evening to wrestle a fall with John or to shoot a round with Elwood, but, though a silver shilling was to be the prize of the victory, it has never been reported that any man earned much money in that fashion. So they lived, these men, in their own lusty, cheery fashion, rude and rough, but honest, kindly and true. Let us thank God if we have outgrown their vices. Let us pray to God that we may ever hold their virtues. The sky may darken, and the clouds may gather, and again the day may come when Britain may have sore need of her children, on whatever shore of the sea they be found. Shall they not muster at her call? The End